guys. Um, I don't have the right words for you at the moment, but you have been simply amazing. I love you all. Thank you. Michael Schumacher swept all before him in 2001 to win his fourth driver's title and help Ferrari to their third straight constructor's crown. Now his aim is to crush the opposition again and equal Fangio's record of five driver's championships. Mika Hakkinen won't be there to stop him. He takes a year's sabbatical, while the Prost team and John Alesi wave goodbye to Formula One. Williams BMW could ruin Schumacher's plans. What must they do to make Juan Pablo Montoya and Ralph Schumacher championship contenders? Consistency and reliability are two of the main limitations that we had last year, so we've certainly worked hard on the factors of the car that will affect that, but also we've been working to produce a fast car as well. McLaren joined Williams on Michelin tyres. Will the French rubber help the English team overhaul the prancing horse? We know we can design a better car, we know we can have a more powerful engine. We believe we're on a quicker tyre and I know I can race real to real with Michael, so we have all the ingredients. Last year's Sauber heroics have earned Kimi Raikkonen his mentor's old seat. Will the new flying fin unsettle the experienced Scott? Clearly David, to continue to be the championship contender, he has to be the new kid on the block. Renault joined the battle, taking over from Benetton. Jano Trulli and Jensen Button take the hot seats with test driver Fernando Alonso. Mika Salo and Alan McNish will race for debutante Toyota, who joined Ferrari and Renault as chassis and engine manufacturers. A mix of new faces and established challengers will make F1 2002 one of the most compelling seasons ever. All the speculation stops here in Melbourne, Australia, the venue for round one. Sports Mad Australians have a new hero, Minardi's Mark Webber. The ex Benetton test driver was front page news as he prepared for his home race. Is he nervous on the eve of the biggest weekend of his career? Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it actually. Can't wait to, uh, to get there and um, get onto the circuit. Straight ahead, mate. It's uh, something that I've been looking forward to for a long time and yeah, can't wait. What does he hope to achieve? Once we get a few sessions under our belt, then we can uh, work out what our realistic goals are going to be. So uh, I want to compete uh, as hard as possible this weekend and try and get to the end of the race, and that's uh, going to be a good thing for our team. There's never been more attention showered on a Minardi driver before, but the easygoing Australian takes it all in his stride. He's joined by the usual suspects and some new faces as the atmosphere builds in the paddock. Aces Michael Schumacher and Rubens Barrichello will race last year's car. What prompted this unusual decision? You reach various stages with a new car where you have to say right stop because you've got to get the car ready for the first race. And we reached the development of a couple of areas of the car where we didn't want to do that, we wanted to carry on. So we made a strategic decision to continue the development of the new car accepting that uh, we would have to start the season with the old car. What I think is they didn't manage to get the car in time, really. And as Michael said it before, you know, he would have preferred to be in the 2002 car, but the 01 wasn't ready. So 
I think they did it because they knew the old car was quick enough to be competitive this year and probably be competitive. Will the jealously guarded modifications do the four-time champion justice this weekend? Oh, we should be faster. I mean, we have improved the engine horsepower. We have improved a little bit uh, uh, details uh, around, which I don't want to get into, obviously. But it will be faster than what we had in Suzuka. How much? Whether it's enough? For sure, finishing races uh, is very important. And, and high levels of reliability tend not to come until later in the season. But that's really the main consideration why we haven't brought a new car, because we, we didn't feel we'd done enough work with it to to be as confident as we wanted to be in uh, the reliability. Almost everybody has an opinion on Ferrari's strategy. Williams' technical director offers one of the more considered. Well, on the one hand, it was a very good chassis and uh, uh, it shouldn't harm them too much. But on the other hand, it wouldn't be too good for us if we got beaten with our 2002 car by Ferrari's 2001 car. The front runners prepare for the moment of truth, the first qualifying session of the season. We will now find out just how fast the new and old cars really are. David Coulthard is one of the first to venture out in these unusually cool conditions, but a daydreaming Jacques Villeneuve ensures the Scot an initial test of the escape road. Nothing much for Ron Dennis and Adrian Newey to worry about as their charge proves just minutes later. Coulthard snatches provisional pole, but the contenders are lining up. Ralph Schumacher lowers the target time, prompting Barrichello to make a move. His teammate is a step ahead and promptly outpaces his brother. <laughs> Using the F2001 is hardly a retrograde step and Barrichello looks on course to reinforce that fact. Has Barrichello put one over his team leader? The oncoming rain should act as a guarantor. Juan Pablo Montoya could be stranded by the shower in a disappointing sixth position. Has he left it too late? No, it's coming down very heavy on the pit straight now, Juan. Really wet, thank you. Well, we can't control the weather, Juan. We've got to have a go at it, don't we? No, when it's, when it's still drizzling and you send me I when it's still drizzling, that's not blame the weather, you know. That's, you know, we, that's risking the car when we don't need to. Timing in a wet-dry session has never been a problem for Barrichello. All his poles have come in similar circumstances. But how will this result affect Ferrari's game plan? And yourself said earlier that um, you might sit down and have a discussion to plan tactics for tomorrow. Have you had that discussion yet? No, we're going to have a nice glass of wine or a bottle and then we see. <laughs> Alcohol was kept to a minimum, but the drivers may be hung over on race tactics as the moment of truth is almost upon us. Unfortunately for Arrows, they get a depressing reality check even before it arrives. Electrical problems leave Frentzen and Bernoldi rooted to the grid as the rest of the field start the warm-up lap. They will now have to start the race from the back of the grid. The worst possible start for team boss Tom Walkinshaw. The other 20 starters have almost completed the lap and it's by no means certain that either Arrows will manage that. Maybe they should have taken a leaf out of Ferrari's book. Will last year's model still reign supreme? Race director Charlie Whiting ends the speculation. However, it's the run to the first corner that will make the headlines. A chain reaction quickly ensues. Yale, yale, 
Thankfully, Ralph is perfectly OK, but there are plenty of mechanical casualties in the midfield. Raikkonen's McLaren escapes relatively unscathed, while the spare cars are prepared for the unfortunate eight. Oh. Safety car, safety car, Yana, safety car, mate. Panic and confusion still reign, but the arrival of the safety car spells the end for the crash victims. Stop, carry on. Can I stop, carry on? Stop, gents. Stop. Button, Fisichella, Ralph Schumacher, Barrichello, both Saubers, Panis and McNish are out of the race. Now the post-mortems can begin. When he closed the door, I tried to go on the other side. As the world's most expensive scrap heap is cleared away, there still appears to be confusion about the status of the race. While the bad news gets back to the garages, the pile-up instigators are ready to face the press. It was a great start. A shame that I uh, couldn't make use out of it. I mean, Rubens changed the direction twice too much, and that was the main problem about it. Um, I mean, uh, he was braking a bit, a fraction too early, but that is down to his decision when to brake. I don't want to say anything about that. It's uh, if I wasn't there, he wouldn't have made the corner. That's as simple as that. You know, it's it's another racing incident. You never. I mean, I'm sure he didn't do it on purpose. He just tried to defend his position without thinking what he was doing. Yeah, I mean, it's silly. I mean, we were. We were going to be first and second out of the uh, out of the corner. For me, I kept my place. He would have gained a position, uh, so it's just silly. Safety car's coming. Let's get out before the safety car. Come on. Go, 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 Heinz. Go, 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 go. While Frentzen gets underway under the gaze of Charlie Whiting, Raikkonen pits to get a new nose and have some debris removed. Meanwhile, the German sends his team's spirits plummeting. There was a red light when I got out of the safety car. Well, you mean in the pit lane you had a red light? That's right, that's correct. I had a red light at the middle exit. What I have to do now? I think you'll have to go to the back of the queue and we'll get a penalty. Just keep your tyres under, under control, keep the uh, temperatures up on your tyres, mate, but everything in the engine looks good. It's also looking good for Raikkonen, who can now drive in comfort and will quickly catch the remaining drivers. Those less fortunate have differing opinions on the race director's decision. Uh, sad, because they didn't stop the race, that's the ridiculous, because most of the, uh, most of the car are still there. Charlie made his, his point pretty clear last year that he wouldn't stop a race only for a starting incident. That has simply two reasons that the drivers learned to be a bit more cautious to the first corner. After five laps, the safety car pulls off, leaving Coulthard in the lead in front of Trulli, Montoya and Michael Schumacher. The first lap smash has thrown up an unexpected running order, but it won't be a surprise to see Coulthard take full advantage of this opportunity. Montoya is desperate to get past Trulli, but cool brakes and tyres aren't sympathetic to impatient drivers. The way is cleared for Schumacher to have a go, and everybody wants to see the world champion demonstrate his overtaking prowess. But Trulli is determined to prove he's not just a qualifying specialist. Further back, Raikkonen is making easy work of the midfield. Pedro de la Rosa's Jaguar relinquishes seventh place to the latest flying fin. Truly is giving the Ferrari staff plenty of nervous moments as he resolutely defends second place. Renault boss Flavio Briatori is glued to the monitor as Schumacher loses precious time behind Truly. However, Schumacher's prayers are answered at turn two. Oil from a terminally wounded car may have been the catalyst, but that won't make Trulli's predicament any easier to take. 
Coulthard's advantage is wiped out thanks to the arrival of the safety car. He prepares to start from scratch but inexplicably leaves the track. Hopefully for the Scots' sake there is a mechanical reason for that embarrassing slip-up. Montoya takes full advantage. He's quickly up to race pace, breaks very late and takes the lead. There's a sense of expectancy in the Ferrari garage. They know that their man won't settle for second best. Montoya grimly hangs on to the lead, but his Michelins are struggling in the cool conditions. The world champion is now perfectly placed and attacks around the outside. Montoya blocks the first move, but he's been set up. Once again, Schumacher lives up to his hype, while his fellow German's swift exit has come back to haunt him. Right, early afternoon, I'm afraid you've got the black flag for leaving the pit the red light's on. Arrow's miserable race comes to a depressing conclusion, when Bernoldi is also black flagged for using the spare car after the race start. Those new Cosworth V10s had no time to show their potential. In stark contrast, Minardi are on cloud nine. Coulthard's in trouble, and sixth place Weber is about to send his team and the home crowd into hysterics. Brace yourselves for a once in a lifetime sight, a Minardi taking a position off a of McLaren. Not wanting to take anything away from the Australian, but it's obvious that Coulthard's McLaren has a major problem. Team boss Ron Dennis resigns himself to the inevitable as the Scot is jammed in sixth and out of the race. This gear selection problem could explain his earlier off. Montoya has slipped back into the clutches of Raikkonen while the race leader goes from strength to strength. The combination of Michael Schumacher, Ferrari and Bridgestone looks even more potent than it did last year. Minardi, with their new Asiatec V10s, have improved by leaps and bounds since 2001. Unfortunately for Weber, the fuel flap doesn't seem to have the same motivation, which frustrates all concerned. Doesn't anybody think I understand that if you turn the pit limiter off, it doesn't open the fuel flap? Jesus Christ, f***ing engineers! No such problems for the wealthier Michelin users. Montoya pits for his only stop, the lap before Raikkonen. The battle for second place is at a crucial stage. The Finn just gets ahead, but running wide ruins all that hard work. He may still be on for his first podium, but losing second place won't sit well with the ultra-competitive Finn. As far as Australia is concerned, there are only two cars in this race as Weber defends fifth place from Mika Salo's Toyota. It's a dream debut for both Weber and Toyota. Both garages are anxious that neither driver takes a pointless risk. However, Weber has been reeled in and Salo is ready to pounce, but the pressure gets to the veteran and two championship points look to be heading to the Italian underdogs. Michael Schumacher has been far easier on his fans' nerves. He cruises across the line to win the Australian Grand Prix in last year's car. Second place Montoya showed flashes of brilliance while Raikkonen marks his entrance to the big time with his first Formula One podium finish. The crowd has saved their biggest cheers for Mark Webber. This is also a moment to savour for fellow Aussie and team boss Paul Stoddart. That's the team's best result for eight years. Montoya and Raikkonen's battle was almost forgotten in the wake of Weber and Schumacher's achievements. Eddie Irvine grabbed a fortunate fourth place, but the spotlight was on Michael Schumacher. Did he enjoy the wheel-to-wheel -wheel action in the early stages? I, I enjoyed the fight, obviously, with him. It was a bit back and forward. 
Uh, I think as well that uh, the tyres played that, a little bit of a role in that. Initially I struggled to get the temperature in, where these guys seem to get faster uh, on top of temperatures. But then it went the other way around, so their tyres went off and, and my, uh, my one came in. So I had a nice chance to, to battle a little bit and finally got first position for us, which was ideal. A single championship point was worth its weight in gold for Toyota, but it almost slipped through their fingers and sent the boss's heart rate rocketing. I said at the time my heart had to be kick-started a couple of times before he was going again. It was incredible, I mean, this something we never expected and it was such a fantastic feeling. Thank you for your assistance. Did you expect this? <laughs> That was all I wanted to do in the first race, to get one point for motivation for the whole team. They've been working three years on a project and no races, no results, and it would be very nice to score a point and we got it. One, uh, what do you say, one swallow doesn't make a summer and I think we need to stay on the earth and uh, see what comes. Next on F1's agenda is a race in the stunning surroundings of Malaysia. The Southeast Asian country is a holiday maker's paradise. But tourism is the last thing on the drivers' minds at the moment. The crippling heat and humidity surrounding the Sepang circuit make sure of that. The amount of fluid lost in these extreme conditions tests the driver's fitness to the limit. It's going to be pretty hard for everybody. I've been here for a couple of days and it just doesn't stop. The relentless heat also puts a great strain on the cars. The teams have a variety of solutions. What have the drivers done to prepare themselves? We've been doing a lot of training outside, um, a lot of cycling long distance to get us just in the, into the heat, really. Um, you know, you don't have to push that hard in training, you just have to be outside. What are the effects of racing in this heat? You lose a lot of weight, you lose a lot of water. And there was a race here in 99 with a steward that I remember weighting myself before and afterwards, and it was like 3.2 kilos, which you don't feel it, but it goes. And uh, it feels sad when you push the button, button for the water and it's, uh, it's just the noise because the water has finished. So you have to play it nicely with the, with the button as well. You cannot just ask for water, water the whole time. As Kimi Raikkonen's tattoo indicates, McLaren aren't too worried about the conditions, thanks to their revolutionary new uniform. Well, I think everybody's hot here, you know, even if they were stood naked, which wouldn't be a pretty sight. We've spent uh, six months with Boss investigating materials, and uh, it's a sort of quasi-silk material which allows the guys to stay a lot cooler. And, um, you know, they've got various combinations of underwear to uh, accommodate the various temperature changes through the year. You know, the biggest difference I think I feel at the moment is these uh, satin trousers with the fitted underpants is giving me, giving me an interesting time as I walk. <laughs> I, I, I think it's, it's this normal warp sense of humour. However, it was in short supply during Friday practice. The Scot had to push his McLaren back to the pits after it suffered an electrical fire. Qualifying wasn't so fraught, but the Scot was only sixth fastest. The battle for pole was dominated by Michael Schumacher and his new nemesis, Juan Pablo Montoya.
The world champion is the first to lay down the gauntlet. There are a lot of cars out there, You're just gonna have to play it. Michael Schumacher waits patiently for Montoya's reply, which is upcoming as he's found a decent gap. However, other drivers aren't the only things to worry about. Remember, call those brakes, call those brakes. Good lap, Wang, good lap. The German has one last attempt to snatch pole from Montoya, who has already played his trump card. Schumacher puts everything into his effort to maintain his 100% pole record in Malaysia. But is it good enough? It is. Depressingly for Williams, Bridgestone have matched Michelin in the hot conditions, where the French company had previously reigned supreme. Montoya must focus on finding more speed for the race, but he's only got one Ferrari ahead of him, unlike Ralph, who lines up behind Barrichello in fourth place. Kuala Lumpur comes alive during the night. Unfortunately, the drivers are oblivious to this, as they have to concentrate on the race. Judgment Day arrives, and try as they might, the drivers and teams can't escape the stifling heat. The crowd definitely has the right idea as the 22-car field sets off from the ironically titled warm-up lap. It's a tense time for the team bosses. The start of the Australian Grand Prix is still a painful memory. Champion goes for his customary start line chop, but Montoya's done his homework. Barrichello tries a wide approach while it's a case of who blinks first at the sharp end. Michael. It's code red at Ferrari, and arrows also have their work cut out. Via, via, bye via. Barrichello leads in the front row's absence, while a downforce deficit sends his teammate tumbling down the order. Montoya gives his verdict as Barrichello completes the first lap ahead of Ralph Schumacher and Raikkonen. Michael's race is now a damage limitation exercise. Launch control problems put Frentzen in a similar situation. Marinello's favourite son starts from scratch, eventually followed by his compatriot. Takuma Sato gives Eddie Jordan plenty to complain about. Crossing, crossing. Okay, thank you. While Fissy Keller and his accidental assailant take an avoidable trip back to the pits, another race is about to be severely compromised. You have a drive through penalty. Stop and stop and go. Drive through penalty. Because of Michael, because of Michael. Williams make unenviable history. Montoya is F1's first recipient of a drive through penalty. I'll be honest with you, this is bullshit. I gave him room, I gave him room. Frustration also mounts in the McLaren camp. Coulthard will soon drop to ninth behind McNish and the recovering Montoya thanks to an ailing Mercedes engine.
The Scot threw in the towel at the end of the lap. I was, I was quite comfortable in behind Kimi because I felt I could go a lap longer uh, at the pit stop and that would give me the advantage I needed to jump him. But of course we don't get to find out if the car doesn't run. The F2001 has enough miles on the clock to reassure Barrichello. The Brazilian has a near six second cushion over Ralf Schumacher, but that's nowhere near enough to relax. Heidfeld's temporarily in fourth, but he's hardly home and dry either. His stop drops him to seventh, but Peter Sauber smells championship points. Barrichello's pit crew will be hoping for more than that as he comes in for his first stop. This hands Ralf Schumacher the lead. He's on a one-stop strategy. Barrichello gives chase, but he's now behind Raikkonen in third. Bernoldi's time is up just when he was on the verge of points. You didn't call me before. I had misfire doing all this lap, and now there's a shit. This is amazing, you know? Raikkonen is also about to lose control of his destiny and second place. He's conveniently near the pits, but that doesn't ease the pain of the double Mercedes failure. Jensen Button is among the beneficiaries. You are P3, Raikkonen is out. Keep pushing, it's a good lap. Irvine comes back down to earth after his unexpected points haul in Australia. He's running seventh, but a botched attempt at lapping Alex Jung puts a points finish out of the question. Four laps later, a malfunctioning clutch ends the philosophical Ulsterman's race. I, I was coming in that lap or the next lap, so I had to push. He made it look like he was leaving me all the room in the world and just chopped across. Maybe that's his line. Um, I'll know in future. <laughs> a fourth Grand Prix win is upcoming for Ralph Schumacher. A scrubbed set of Michelins and the heat may put it beyond doubt. Barrichello briefly took the lead, but has made his second stop and has to give chase once again. Is it the heat or the unaccustomed game of catch-up that's getting to Ross Braun? His number two driver is struggling to make an impression, but that's the least of his worries right now. The Brazilian has the knack of discovering the more delicate Ferrari V10s, a fact that his legion of fans and his technical director know only too well. It was a hard work out there and uh, uh, I was trying the, the best I could. It was, uh, the tires were holding up together, but at that, th at that pace, it was very difficult to keep on going. Ralph maintains that velocity in the lead as his brother blazes a trail towards the front. The world champion drops to fourth, just behind the best battle on the track. It's Williams versus Renault for second. The Colombian attacks, but telegraphs are moved down the inside. Button has the right line for turn two, hangs on to second and keeps the troops entertained. This time, the Colombian makes his move stick. It's a no-lose situation for Pierre Dupasquier, but the Brit has lost this battle of the Michelin runners. <laughs> Toyota are having a far more stressful time. Sarlo has just been in for a stop, leaving them ill-prepared for McNish. Used tyres are all that's left for his final stint, and all that will cost him points. Another Brit is also in trouble. Keep pushing, gents, keep pushing. Michael's closing, Michael is closing. A rear suspension fault will make pushing very difficult. The Renault looks decidedly nervous and it looks like a matter of when rather than if. A cruel blow for the young Brit, his first podium finish will have to wait. Ralph Schumacher has had more than his fair share of luck in this race, but he hasn't put a foot wrong since the start he wins the Malaysian Grand Prix.
A huge weight has been lifted from Patrick Head and Sam Michael's shoulders as Montoya makes it a Williams 1-2, the first for six years. His crash partner has also staged a great recovery to take third place, but Flavio Briatore knows that Button deserved better. Ralph takes his fourth career win. Montoya is runner-up again, but third place is enough for Michael to retain the championship lead. Sauber have pleased their Malaysian title sponsors with a double points finish. Ralph accepts the plaudits from his manager, Willy Weber, while Montoya is in no mood to swap pleasantries. I wasn't going to give him half of the truck because you know, we're racing. I gave him enough truck for him to go around the first corner. I could see him understanding to me, and when I saw it, it was a bit, I couldn't really do anything. I was expecting just to touch a little bit, but that was it. Do you think maybe he was uh, dealt with quite harshly today? Um, I, honestly, to be honest, yes, because uh, I, wouldn't, I would think we have seen uh, situations far more extreme where nothing has happened, and today, a little touch, uh, uh, something was, uh, was done. Does Ralph have any sympathy for his brother and Montoya? I felt sorry for both of them. Uh, at, at the same time, I was happy for myself. That's, that's obvious, isn't it? <laughs> Ralph's win lifts him to third in the Drivers' Championship, four points behind his brother. Williams now lead the Constructors' Championship by eight points over Ferrari. Coulthard's second straight retirement put McLaren on the back foot. To make matters worse, neither his nor Raikkonen's Mercedes engines lasted the race. A lack of grunt and reliability is handicapping a good chassis, to the frustration of technical director Adrian Newey. Raikkonen's third place in Australia is small consolation for the perennial frontrunners. While the Silver Arrows struggle to regroup, Williams have taken the fight to Ferrari, and that's not the only reason why Patrick Head is excited. <laughs> You make an old man very happy. <laughs> the team has waited since Portugal 1996 for their last 1-2 finish, which makes the champagne taste that much sweeter. However, the team will have to put their triumphs behind them as the championship moves to Brazil. Hi, I'm Carla, and I want to invite you to come with me on a tour through my city, Sao Paulo. As you can see, everyone is very busy in Sao Paulo. This is the financial area, that's why it's so crowded. Every day, four million people pass to this area. This is the one of the most popular drinks in Brazil, the coconut juice. This is the oldest building in Sao Paulo, which we call Schoolyard. It was founded in 1554 by the Jesuits, and this is the foundation monument. This is the Figueira Rubaiá restaurant. Figueira is the name of this street. In Sao Paulo, you can find all kinds of cuisines, like Italian, Japanese, Greek. That's why the city was chosen the international gastronomic capital of the world. municipal market. It's been here since 1933. But if you really like different fruits, this is the right place. Most of the people I know uh, are a little bit of afraid to come to Sao Paulo because they think it's too dangerous. What do you think about that? Don't come. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. So enjoy. Interlagos is certainly a more hazardous place since the FIA instituted new punishments for poor driving. From the Brazilian Grand Prix onwards, the stewards have the power to punish reckless drivers by moving them 10 places down the grid at the following race. 
The news has been met with a mixed response. It's nice to see, to be aggressive, it's nice to see some spectacular overtaking. Mm. Uh, now we have to be very gentle, very careful. I like sometimes we have some hot moments, you know, in the first corner. This is the, is the, is the things everybody likes, the spectator likes this show. I'm little about, you know, I need to, to think more about this. I'm not 100% positive, but if it's the rule, we need to follow the rule anyway. If you cause an accident in one race, you should be penalised for that race, not following on to the next, next race. It's just, it's just a very strange system. Listen, the rule has been there before that if somebody behaves out of order, he can be disqualified for the next race. So if somebody does that, instead of being disqualified, you then have this new rule applying. But not for, for what has happened in Malaysia. I mean, that's not really the intention of it. What happened with Michael in the last race, even though you know, I'm, I believe they shouldn't be penalised, and a lot of people believe they shouldn't be penalised, that wouldn't be a case to put you back 10 places in the next race. Uh, so I think the difficult bit is we need some consistency. I think the key will be to, to wait a few races to see who gets punished for what and then we'll know what we're allowed to do. After all the relevant viewpoints were taken, the media focused on Michael Schumacher as the Ferrari F2002 broke cover to make its Grand Prix debut. Marinello's latest model was only available for the world champion. Barrichello had to make do with the F2001, which is hardly past its drive-by date. The new car features revised aerodynamics to assist airflow to the rear wing. These could magically appear on other cars in the near future. The car has been extensively tested but the unforgiving Interlagos circuit always catches out those who are trying to find their limits, even four times world champions. The F2002 didn't quite get off to a dream start. Qualifying saw Montoya and the other Michelin runners make major strides. However, it still took all of the Colombian skill to take pole by just over one-tenth of a second from Michael Schumacher. Ralph qualified third, giving Williams a chance of their second straight 1-2. First question is, how do you feel lining up alongside one another after Malaysia? I don't think we have a problem with that, huh? do we? No. no. Nick Heidfeld was a major part of a bizarre incident during Sunday morning warm-up. Enrique Bernoldi crashed heavily at the Senna S. This brought out the red flags and the medical car. Normally, this would have made the area safe. What was the Sauber driver's version of events? I didn't see uh, any yellow flags. And um, then also when I could have seen the car, I had the Ferrari in front, which took a bit of my view. And then just suddenly I had the car in front and uh, I, had, I had nowhere to go. Nobody was in a tighter spot than the Brazilian. I thought that everybody saw that there was a safety car already on the track. But then when I just hear the car, hitting the grass. I just look and the car just avoided me by this much. I said it's getting bad now, huh? so I decided to run. He didn't fare much better in qualifying and lines up 21st, nine places behind home race debutante Massa. Salo is back in the top 10, but he's nowhere near the center of attention. All educated eyes are on the Ferrari F2002. some interesting features on it that you don't get to see when the cars get put into the garage, so uh, you never stop learning. After everybody gets acquainted with Marinello's potential world beater, the attention shifts to Schumacher Montoya 3.
They're both away well, while Renault's superior traction control helps them blast past the McLarens. The tension is almost unbearable as Michael makes a move. That joy might be short-lived as Montoya prepares to counter-attack with devastating consequences. Nose for Montoya. Nose for Montoya. With a front wing, front wing and tyres. Despite the bunting, the Colombian has nothing to celebrate. The Schumacher brothers are out front, followed by Trulli. Barrichello springs into action and takes fifth from Coulthard. Montoya drops to an aggrieved 20th. That's amazing. No, it is completely amazing. Flavio Briatore looks astonished at Barrichello's pace, but his team think they know why. Yeah, don't worry, the jury is on two stops. The jury is on two stops. Don't worry, mate. Looking good. Balance looks good. Rubinho is now up to third behind Ralph Schumacher. He proves as easy an obstacle as the Renault. Meanwhile, Montoya is struggling to keep his mind on the job. I've got a question. What the f*** are they doing to Michael? One, keep pushing. I'll sort it out later. After Renault's lightning start, delaying action isn't an option for Coulthard. He easily disposes of Button and takes fifth place. An even more gratifying sight for Ferrari, their cars in a dominant 1-2. Barrichello's fuel light F2001 is allowed through and Interlagos rocks to the sound of national pride. The strategy appears to be paying off handsomely for the new leader. Until Barrichello's Brazilian Grand Prix jinx strikes yet again. That's his ninth retirement in 10 home Grand Prix. It's almost as if a higher power doesn't want him to do well here. What was the reason this time? Some hydraulic pressure. I just lost it, no gears, no drive, nothing. I was just flat out, just driving flat out. That's all I could do. His bulletproof teammate will be joined shortly by his brother, who's in hot pursuit. Simone Abdelnoll looks on as her boyfriend seeks another Renault scalp. A dive down the inside at turn one is the standard attack, but Trulli handles that with ease and stays third. Olivier Panis couldn't care less about the McLaren-Renault fight, Gearbox failure causes his third consecutive retirement, while Bernoldi restarts after repairs to a broken track rod. News reaches Tom Walkinshaw that Frentzen's Arrows has a similar problem. He quite rightly ends both their races for safety reasons. Pablo Montoya certainly didn't expect his son to be battling De La Rosa after qualifying. He eases into ninth, and his team believe he can go a lot further. Good job. You can make P3. Michael Schumacher pits at just over half distance, indicating that this is his only stop. Ralph inherits the lead. He's yet to stop and will do very well to stay there. Michael looks to have the advantage thanks to improved Bridgestones and Ross Braun's tactics. He's about to lap Sarlo, who's getting closer to the points. Peter Sauber hasn't pulled a fast one on anybody in this race. His Brazilian charge is battling Weber for 13th. The Minardi has the inside line. Massa tries to squeeze him onto the grass and pays a heavy price. He may not get too much sympathy for his plight. McNish's race was stymied by debris from Montoya's accident and locking the rear wheels puts it to bed.
Ralph's race is far from over, but he'll need help from his pit crew to reach his ultimate goal. Pierre Dupasquier has seen Michelin's tyre advantage evaporate, leaving Ralph with it all to do as Michael retakes the lead. It's now time for Coulthard's crucial stop. The Scot has been stuck in fourth for over 30 laps behind Trulli, who has already made his sole stop. Gala McLaren stopping now. Push hard, mate. Push hard now. McLaren's famed pit work and fuel consumption makes the difference. Coulthard is now on course for a podium finish. The atmosphere is far better in the Williams garage as Ralph closes on his brother. He can use the boost limiter to get closer to him. Ralph needs a boost. He has precious little time left to make it two wins in a row. Time has run out for Trulli. His third straight retirement costs him a probable points finish. The Italian hoped he'd left his frustrations behind at Jordan. Raikkonen makes a more frightening exit. His friends fear the worst, but fortunately the Finn is perfectly OK. The replay shows that it was wheel hub failure that sent Raikkonen flying across the gravel. Fortunately for the Silver Arrows, Coulthard looks safe in third. The Ferrari crew get ready to celebrate, but Michael is still under threat from Ralph. But Big Brother rarely makes mistakes under pressure. Fantastic. I just never came close enough, not on the straight, never. And, you know, I didn't want to do anything stupid. Perhaps a subtle reference to Montoya, who has battled back to fifth. He finished just behind Jensen Button, who moves up to fourth in the Drivers' Championship. Michael is now eight points clear. That will further infuriate Montoya. The big duel at the start, how did you see it? How did I see it? You meant to do one move, he did it, I went for the inside, he did another one and took my front wing off. You know, but probably because it's Michael, they're not going to do anything. I don't think it is really important what he says in this moment. You all know that racing drivers sort of uh, have an initial reaction on something. When they see maybe the video, they, they see it differently. I know I moved over to the left uh, quite far before the braking and uh, he must have touched me at some stage. You will have a chat together? Not really. You know, he does that again, I won't live. Whether or not that threat is carried out remains to be seen. But in the meantime, Michael soaks up the adulation of a convincing victory. Coulthard will be relieved to finally open his account, but he is already giving away 20 points to his rival. The schedule stays hectic as the teams travel to the third continent in four races for the San Marino Grand Prix. The people of the Romagna region are immensely proud of their past, but like their local F1 team, they enjoy life in the fast lane. This weekend, McLaren's new high-tech communications centre was the hottest ticket in town. Straight out of a science fiction movie, it features media and meeting rooms, catering facilities and will issue post-race press packs containing sandwiches and drinks. Manner from heaven for weary reporters. Who are the brains behind this state-of-the-art facility? There's only two people involved. It's actually the architect that I uh, use for my homes and, uh, and I. And, um, it's really been a fun project. It's, uh, it's taken quite a long time, it's a three-year project, it's a year of conception, uh, six months of design and one and a half years of manufacture. At their more modest mobile HQ, new rivals Renault are reflecting on their great start to the season. Leading the charge is Jensen Button, who came close to his first podium finish at round two. Obviously, Malaysia is very disappointing, and you know I think that a podium is on the cards, and it, and you know later in the season it should should come. But 
expect uh, probably what I'm looking for this season. A win would be nice, but I think that's going to be very tough because it's so so competitive now right at the front. Jano Trulli's resolute defence in Australia gave Renault's front-running aspirations credibility. Does he think the car excels in one particular area? Well, we, it's just a compromise, our car. We've got a very good uh, package of engine. It's very light and low. With the power is increasing uh, race by race. And obviously, the guys have done a great um, step forward over the winter time on the aerodynamic uh, side of the car. So basically, we got a good package. And Tyres as well, performing very well. The Renault team seems to have the best launch control system. Is that one of the biggest advantages you can have in Formula One? Having the best car and the best engine and best tyres is probably the biggest uh, you know, plus point, but it, it does help us a lot and I think uh, we, sh we showed that in Brazil with, with the t passing the two McLarens and you know, hopefully it's going to help us here. It seems to work better on circuits that are quite slippery, so we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. Unfortunately for Button, truly coped better with the cool conditions to qualify eighth, one place ahead of his teammate. The session was dominated by Ferrari. Barrichello set provisional pole in his first competitive outing in the F2002. The Michelin runners struggled. Raikkonen's problems were typical. The practice sessions were washed out, leaving little time to acclimatise to a dry track. The Finn and his Scottish teammate will have to make do with the third row. Changeable conditions and a technical track proved too much for Alex Jung, who failed to reach the 107% qualifying standard. In the dying seconds of the session, Michael Schumacher snatched pole from Barrichello, who had held on to it for half an hour, courtesy of Michael's T-car. Their own tyre test here in February gave them a huge advantage. <laughs> Ferrari's domination of practice and qualifying ensures a Tifosi full house on race day. They expect and demand a home win. Ace designer Rory Byrne has timed his visit well, but don't mention timing to Alex Jung. Fisichella languishes in 15th behind his rookie teammate and seven places behind compatriot Trulli. No hard feelings before the start, but now it's time to get down to business. Cora Schumacher and the Williams mechanics hope for a repeat of Ralph's lightning start of a year ago. He's well on his way. Montoya tries a hopeful lunge down the inside of Barrichello as Ralph slots in behind his brother. And that'll do fine for Cora. McNish is far from satisfied. He lost drives seconds after the start and is forced out of the race. This is Toyota's first mechanically induced retirement. At the front, Michael Schumacher leads from Ralph, Barrichello and Montoya. Raikkonen spots a gap at Tamburello and demotes his teammate to sixth. Sato loses many more places thanks to a gearbox problem. That stall leads to the resetting of the electrics. And a successful exit. The latest Ferrari is still running smoothly and the world champion is swiftly extending his lead. His brother is doing a great job keeping Barrichello behind him. Teammate Montoya is struggling with a poorly balanced car and is desperate for information. Where am I looking the sign? Talk to me, where am I looking the sign? Check this two and three at the moment. I'll keep you more informed. Gary Anderson doesn't need to translate electronic data for Sato. The Japanese knows his Jordan's gearbox has had enough. Heidfeld is bereft of information due to a radio problem. This is the German's third visit to the pits within three laps after mistakenly thinking his team had called him in. At least Sauber have still got two cars running, unlike Jordan. A loss of hydraulic pressure makes it three retirements in four races for Fisichella. Button has a much better scorecard and he looks set to improve on it here. He rejoins 10th ahead of his teammate and has a McLaren within range. Villeneuve isn't short on encouragement either. 
As soon as Alistair turns the lollipop, you've got to make sure it's in gear. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. He rejoins in 10th, but will need plenty of good fortune to pick up BAR's first points. There's precious little fortune for Toyota as Sala retires with a gearbox problem. Eddie Irvine moves over to let Ralph Schumacher through, but isn't so obliging to Barrichello. Ross Braun keeps his thoughts to himself, unlike Ferrari's number two. The Italians had the last laugh when De La Rosa's Jaguar succumbed to drive shaft failure. The Spaniard didn't seem too bothered, though. I think it's always better to retire when you are out of the points and with no chance than when you are. So three finishes, this was uh, about to happen. It's crunch time at the front. Michael and Ralph have stopped and Barrichello leads. He won't stay there, but his mechanics could hand him second. Bad news for Williams, but Ferrari are well on course for a home 1-2. Coulthard is in from fifth, but Renault's prophecy is now reality. Button justifies his team's optimism and is up to fifth. Raikkonen reinforces McLaren's doom and gloom. His exhaust has broken and the high temperatures could affect the suspension. McLaren choose the only option. Barrichello finds himself temporarily in the lead, but Ferrari's natural order will re-establish itself following his final stop. Coulthard's last stop arrives minus a tyre change. It's his only chance to catch Button. But even this desperation tactic doesn't pay off. Further back, the other Renault's hold on eighth looks far more precarious. Massa is on the prowl. His daring move down the inside at Rivazza produces magnificent results. That goes double for Michael Schumacher, who is about to take his third win of the season at the late Enzo Ferrari's home track. Fifth place button has also given Renault reason to party. Fantastic drive, one place ahead of DC. Nice job. Well done, James Strong, well done. Cheers, boys. Nice one. Yeah, baby. It's good for the morale of the team, it's good for everybody. You know, finishing the race with Bocari is the first time. And we take a point to McLaren. This uh, is very good motivation for my people. Schumacher nearly always delivers the goods, but credit must also go to Rory Byrne and to Barrichello for his and Michael's seventh one-two. In fact, it's the 20th anniversary of the Prancing Horse's last one-two at Imola. Both Williams could do nothing to halt their progress, while Coulthard finished a lap down to claim the last championship point. For once, Barrichello is centre of attention. In a way, uh, right now, I'm, I'm so happy because uh, I had not had not finished the first three races, so it's the start of my season. It could also be the start of another period of Ferrari supremacy and one long party for the Tifosi and their heroes. What, what, uh, what can you say? I'm, I'm, I'm certainly delighted. I look... <laughs> it's a great day for... You deserve this hug. Well, I mean, uh, I hope so. I mean, we, we did we did a good job. We did no mistakes. Everything was right. So therefore, uh, I hope uh, people feel we deserve it. In general, it seems that we are slightly too slow and compared to the Ferraris, and we have to go back home and think about it. I'm very very pleased. I'm pleased for the public, of course. I'm pleased uh, for the classific and I please uh, for the drivers because uh, particularly Barrichello his uh, second place after such a good qualifying is very very important. The best antidote to a wet weekend is some Catalan sunshine. Viva Barcelona!
The home of the Spanish Grand Prix is bursting with pride and self-confidence. Barcelona possesses many top-class sports facilities. The Circuit de Catalunya is a shining example. On the eve of the race, Felipe Massa celebrated his 21st birthday. The caterers worked overtime in Spain as Pedro de la Rosa reached the 50 Grand Prix milestone at his home race. Contrast the festivities at Jaguar with the furrowed brows at Minardi. Paul Stoddart's team was blighted by wing failures. Mark Webber was first to suffer during Friday practice. The demand for new parts remained brisk as qualifying saw Alex Jung take to the curbs. Of course, the Ferraris remained rock solid and Michael Schumacher took his third pole of the season. The red cars from Maranello monopolised the front row, with Rubens Barrichello making his team leader work hard for the top slot. The Minardis were having a hard time just staying on the track. Sunday warm-up saw Weber suffer the killer blow. The actual part concerned in Mark's car today was a brand new manufactured part fitted to the car this morning. And it's clear to see the failure is along this stress line. Now, although we have other brand new rear wings here, and although we have another earlier design of rear wing that does not incorporate those rivets, we feel Although we're confident we could have run this afternoon very safely, that given the circumstances it would have been irresponsible to do so until we've had time to take these parts back to the factory and to totally, totally analyse every aspect of this failure and prepare fully for the Austrian race in two weeks' time. So sadly we are withdrawing. Minardi became the first team to withdraw for safety reasons since Sauber pulled out of the Brazilian Grand Prix two years ago. The Minnow's misfortunes were good news for Eddie Irvine, who had been sent to the back of the grid for fuel irregularities. His former Jordan teammate will be looking forward to this race after pushing the championship leader so hard in qualifying. But disaster strikes just seconds into the warm-up lap. A gear selection problem leaves the Brazilian with a lot of work to do. Team principal Jean Todd looks relatively relaxed, despite the magnitude of the task that lies ahead for his mechanics. It's all hands on deck as the race against time to get Barrichello back on the grid begins, but they look to be fighting a losing battle. Montoya now has a clean run from fourth, but Patrick Head will be wary of sixth place button and his Renault's sought after traction control. The Schumacher brothers get away well. Button is immediately on the back of Montoya, but the Colombian breaks the toe, and now Raikkonen is right with the Brit. The Finn drives right round Button, and the boss isn't best pleased. Schumacher leads from his brother, Montoya, Raikkonen, and then Button. Heidfeld is the second best Bridgestone runner in eighth. Unfortunately for Michelin, De La Rosa's Jaguar is bringing up the rear, and trying too hard to change that sends him spinning into retirement. At least the Spaniard is near the top of one official chart, but unfortunately, it's the list of non classified finishers. That particular page is topped by Barrichello. It's a bitter pill to swallow after showing so well in San Marino. The next casualty suffered a heart-stopping moment on the start-finish straight. Raikkonen suffered a spectacular rear wing failure, providing a stern test for Button's reactions. The Finns' Minardi-esque accident brings the total of broken wings to four this weekend. Wisely, McLaren don't bother replacing the damaged part and retire Raikkonen in the interests of safety. Back in the midfield, ninth-placed Frentzen leads a seven-car train, which swiftly shrinks to six as Fissy Keller loses hydraulic pressure. I think you'd have to say it's finished. Eddie Jordan's viewing gets even more depressing when Sato takes too much speed into the penultimate turn and there's no return from there. From a rookie finding his limits, we go to a four-time world champion who is lapping around a second quicker than the competition. 
compatriot Frentzen is now seventh and right in the thick of the action. Massa stays ahead and the German needs to focus on keeping Panis behind him. The Frenchman has already stopped and slick BAR pit work has helped him into ninth. Sir Frank Williams looks justifiably concerned as his drivers are on the verge of battling for second. But Ralph's curb hopping antics put pay to that mouth-watering prospect, leaving the German to throw away the debris in disgust. Patrick Head won't be impressed either, as chaos ensues during a needless pit stop. Put that guy back on then. Put, put, put that guy back on. Ralph's impromptu stop drops him to 13th. Ten places further ahead, the Battle of the Brits is hotting up. Coulthard is now within striking distance. The McLaren Mercedes easily outdrags the Renault into turn one, nudges it out of the way and takes third. Definitely let Yano so fast you, let Yano so fast you please. A hydraulic problem leaves Button dangerously vulnerable. Ralph's troubles are also ongoing. This is the second new nose in the space of 12 laps. We're now into the second round of stops. Can the Renault mechanics help fifth place Button keep Heidfeld at bay? It's desperately close and potentially dangerous as they go side by side down the pit lane. Heidfeld grabs the advantage after the speed limiters are switched off. Montoya is far enough ahead of Coulthard to keep second place, which should make for a stress-free stop. The Colombian is given the all-clear, but too soon. The fuel hose is still connected, and the lollipop man is in the wrong place at the wrong time. Williams chief mechanic Carl Gaden has sustained injuries to his foot and is immediately rushed to the medical center. More woe for BAR boss David Richards as Panis, who looked on course for points, retires thanks to a broken exhaust. There's apprehension in the Arrows garage as Frentzen closes in on Massa and a precious championship point. The English team think it's theirs for the taking. He's pushing nine, he will make a mistake. By rights, Button should be ahead of this battle for fifth, but the young Brit's hydraulic handicap puts pay to that and eventually terminates his race. Engine failure also takes care of his teammate. Ferrari have had their share of technical problems, but they rarely affect the four-time world champion during the race. Michael Schumacher wins the Spanish Grand Prix, one of his easiest victories. Heidfeld finishes fourth, his best result of the season. And Frentzen earns Arrow's first point of 2002. Nice steering, Heinz. Thank you very much. Yeah, Ralph, he stopped. No, he was behind you, mate. Ralph's depressing race goes out with a bang. Michael offers little brother a lift, but Ralph declines a ride on the victory taxi. Montoya finished just over 35 seconds behind the world champion, with Kulfar taking his second podium of the season, while Massa didn't crack under the pressure and earned two points. Ralph finds his preferred choice of lift offers a unique sitting position, while Frentzen gets the conquering hero treatment. <laughs> the boss is just as pleased. I think that, you know, the thing that makes you really happy is you were in the race, you know, he was there, he was competitive, we were racing with all the top teams and, uh, you know, we had a huge amount of work in the last few weeks and I'm really pleased for all the guys because they're putting a tremendous effort. Even more hard work will be required to beat Michael Schumacher, who takes his fourth win out of five races. His championship lead is now up to 21 points over Montoya, who is only three points ahead of his teammate. 
Ferrari lead the Constructors' Championship by just seven points, with McLaren trailing 37 points behind. Ron and Lisa Dennis look on as Coulthard finds one of the few ways to get your hands on a race-winning trophy this season. It's time to leave behind the sun-kissed Mediterranean and move into the peaceful surroundings of Austria's Styrian Mountains. Fat chance of it staying that way when Formula One's in town. The A1 ring has gained the reputation for great action and entertainment. Last year's race also delivered plenty of controversy. Let Michael pass for the championship to Ben Spazer. Last year, you were understandably upset having to pull over and let Michael pass for second. How would you feel if on Sunday you were asked to pull over when you're in the lead for Michael so that he could at least win the Austrian Grand Prix for the first time? I don't like to read too much into the future. We wait until Sunday and then we see what's going to happen. I mean, it's no... If in life we get worried about too many things, we're burning energy and it's not worth. So let's wait until Sunday and see. Underneath that hat is the new colour hair. Why? Well, it was simply an accident and the only way out, but it's going to be changed soon. <laughs> what do you mean? You picked up your wife's hair bottle or something, did you? I thought it was shampoo. No, it was simply the hair cutter. I don't want to use the word, but made a mistake. <laughs> Ralph put his bad hair day behind him to qualify second and split the Ferraris. The team practised hard to avoid a repeat of the mistake that left Carl Gaydon on the sidelines with a swollen and bruised foot. The Sauber drivers were excelling themselves both off and on the track. Heidfeld and Massa qualified fifth and seventh, their highest ever grid positions. But Barrichello was wearing the biggest smile of all. Michael Schumacher used the spare car but could do no better than third, giving the popular Brazilian his fifth Formula One pole position. Race day could see Barrichello and Heidfeld put in career best performances. Heidfeld's opportunity comes via out-qualifying both the McLarens. Barrichello is raring to go despite the Castrol turns knack of creating mayhem. Both Ferraris make good starts and Michael is immediately alongside Ralph. Montoya gets swamped by Heidfeld and Raikkonen and decides that discretion is the best weapon. Raikkonen is too aggressive and Massa's mechanics may have to pick up the pieces. The Ferraris take advantage of the chaos behind and there's yet more action. As Heidfeld outbreaks Ralph for third, Montoya climbs to fifth and Villeneuve uses Frentzen as a means to an end. Villeneuve's robust tactics give Craig Pollock cause for concern, but he emerges undamaged to hunt down his next victim. 13th place Trulli's Renault presents no problems to the Canadian's lightly fuelled BAR. Even Raikkonen's barbecued Mercedes engine doesn't slow him down. The Finns' fourth retirement is in stark contrast to the serene progress of the Ferraris. Massa's race has been full of incidents. His rear suspension is testament to that. It's game over for the rookie. Villeneuve looks unstoppable. Despite a horsepower deficit, Salo's Toyota is demoted to eighth. The Finnish veteran is no easy picking, though, and will be hard to resist on the run down to the Remus curve. As one BAR slices through the field, another puts on a spectacular show for the grandstands. Yet another engine failure for the cursed Frenchman leaves a hazard in the middle of the start-finish straight. Unsurprisingly, this prompts an appearance by the safety car. Ferrari are quick on the uptake and Barrichello arrives for his first of two stops. Michael Schumacher forms a queue as Marinello's finest save their drivers valuable time. 
Ross Braun and Jean Todd turn their attention to Barrichello, who has retained his lead. Meanwhile, the safety car is back in the pits, but Michael Schumacher has dropped to third behind Ralph. Heidfeld battles for fifth, but the German is too eager on the brakes and the repercussions are horrific. That sends shockwaves down the pit lane. I saw that it was right in front of me. Good chance. You're right, Tuck. You're right, Tuck. Sato's non reaction prolongs the agony, while Heidfeld is safely evacuated. The replay illustrates what a lucky escape Montoya had. Heidfeld escaped with bruising, but Sato is being taken to hospital. Fortunately, he looks to have escaped serious injury. After a second safety car period, Barrichello leads from Ralph and Michael Schumacher and Montoya. The battle for fifth is of special interest to Mercedes engine guru Mario Illion. A difference in fuel strategies makes Honda look superior to their German competitors. Villeneuve has yet to make his second stop, but Coulthard is still on course for a points finish. Asia Tech engine failure sets Alex Jung up for a long walk back to the pits. Coulthard's race is compromised by oil, gift wrapping sixth place for Fisichella. Three places further up the order, Montoya comes in for his sole stop. He'll lose out to Villeneuve, but could emerge ahead of his teammate. Montoya exits in fourth, but Ralph is within striking distance. His brother makes his second visit to the pits. He currently leads, but Barrichello has made his final stop and regains P1. Villeneuve's second stop sees him outside the points, but another fiery Honda cremation sends the Canadian running for cover. Events of a more covert nature are unfolding on the Ferrari pit wall. Barrichello's new Ferrari contract is about to be put to the test. For the second year running, Barrichello must yield to his teammate, but this time he has to forfeit a win. Is that an order too far? Rubens conceals the plan for as long as possible, to the utter disgust of the Austrian fans. Ross Braun remains unrepentant. Ross Rubens had won that race, hadn't he? Oh yes, you know, Rubens won the race today, but uh, uh, in the interest of Ferrari and the Drivers' Championship, we've made the decision. We were telling Michael not to push, we were telling Rubens not to push. We're watching everything, so you can't call that a race. The ferocity of the crowd's reaction stuns Schumacher and Barrichello. Many will ask why Barrichello didn't ignore Jean Todd's orders. What should I do? I have on the contract that I have to obey others as much as Michael. Eh? He, he has on the same the same clause. So. If I disobey right now, I just beginning of my uh, two and a half years of contract. So people would ask me, so why don't you go back to a team that you, you top? Maybe they won't give a car for me to win. Schumacher's most controversial victory overshadows a great race. Montoya takes his fourth podium of the season, while Fissi Keller earns Jordan's first points of 2002. It wasn't a long preparation of discussion. They came on in the last uh, couple of meters on, on the radio and said he would back off. And I didn't feel like, but then I, uh, I, have, I have to be honest to say now it was probably the wrong decision to, to win this race. Yes, I, I agree. But uh, if I had the chance to, to, to turn it around, I would probably do. But 
I, I cannot know. Under pressure from the thousands of Austrian fans, Schumacher does what he feels is the right thing, but that will only get him into trouble with the FIA. What could have been a perfect weekend for Barrichello has ended with crowd hostility and an intense media grilling. The recriminations are sure to follow Ferrari to Monte Carlo. Perhaps a dose of the high life will take Ferrari's mind off the Austrian backlash. For sheer decadence, nothing beats Monte Carlo. You can practically taste the excess. As Michael Schumacher ran the gauntlet of the crowd on arrival, the outrage over Ferrari's tactics was all too obvious. Barrichello got a far better reception, but the controversy over the Austrian Grand Prix and its podium ceremony refuses to die down. Even if you're embarrassed because everybody is booing at you, step up there and you accepted taking the win, you know, you didn't slow down, you felt good about it, you raised your hand on, on, on the last lap until you heard people booing at you. Step up there, take your trophy and, and be a man. Years and years ago, Phil Hill actually was brought in during a Grand Prix to give his car to, to Fangio to go out and finish that Grand Prix. And that was back in the days when, you know, men were men and, and you know, classic Grand Prix racing. So I'm not quite sure what's happened from that point to be such public outrage today. 80,000 people there, or the media, and. Uh... I am completely the side of the media, for once. Everyone's got their own opinion. The main thing was they got a fantastic one too. Um, but I'd like to see Rubens win. Uh, Michael is the only driver who was able to win a championship. He's so fired of his teammate that there's no discussion. I mean, Rubens had a nice weekend and was better than my brother, but I mean, it's for the team and it was the right decision. I would have taken the same. Could you imagine doing the same thing at Williams? Uh, team orders, no. We, they tried that last year and it didn't work. <laughs> McLaren are hoping their latest innovation will be far more productive. The new front wishbone arrangement gives a tighter turning circle, ideal for a twisty street circuit like Monaco. The new system really comes into its own at the circuit's trademark first and second gear hairpins. Removing a small section from the wishbone helps the McLaren achieve the desired effect. However, it didn't seem to help Kimi Raikkonen. That off at La Rascas during practice wasn't the end of the young Finn's misfortunes. Saturday practice saw Raikkonen join the Sandavot Hall of Shame and a problem with the oil system blighted his qualifying session. The Finn was forced to use Coulthard's T-car, his fourth chassis, to line up sixth. His teammate used all that extra turning power to plant his McLaren on the front row. Michael Schumacher was also in the hunt for pole, but his Bridgestones didn't match the Michelins on the twists and turns of Monte Carlo. The world champion lines up third. Montoya's Michelins were on song, and together with a breathtaking effort in the dying seconds, he pulled off one of the best laps ever seen in the Principality. That's his second pole of the season, and it's Formula One's most sought after. The Colombian is well aware of the uncompromising nature of this, the most famous street circuit. It possesses many unique features, including the first Ferrari-less front row of the championship. 
Here, perhaps more than anywhere else, the start can make or break a race. The Schumacher brothers will be primed for the run down to saint -Devod. The usual first lap bottleneck makes for uneasy viewing for the teams. Can Coulthard capitalise on the pressure Montoya must be under? The Scot definitely got the better start and grabs the all-important line into the first corner. Michael stays ahead of Ralph, while Barrichello loses out to Trulli and Raikkonen. Coulthard quickly cancels out Montoya's qualifying efforts, while Villeneuve's hopes of a decent finish fade courtesy of a clutch problem. Just getting back to the pits to start again will be a result. Approaching to back, Coulthard leads from Montoya, Michael and Ralph Schumacher. Santa Vaud often provides plenty of entertainment, but it has the opposite effect on Ove Anderson, thanks to McNish's mistake. The replay shows that the Scot paid a heavy price for riding the curves. In contrast, Toyota's Honda-powered rivals are on the march. Fisichella makes light work of Sarlo for 10. Eddie Jordan is hoping for more points after the team's bittersweet weekend in Austria. Sato was told to let his more experienced teammate through. He just manages to do that, but his execution left a lot to be desired. The immediate concern is for the Japanese driver's safety. Gary Anderson confirms Sato's second lucky escape. Almost obscured by the mayhem is the all-Brazilian battle for 10. Bernoldi gets more momentum out of the final corner and powers past Massa. The Sauber driver hits back with a spot of late braking, but he's lost all front downforce. Bernoldi rejoins in 16th, while Massa will be lucky to get away with just an earful from his team. Michael Schumacher is swift and error-free as he closes on Montoya. Are the Colombians Michelins going through a lean spell? It could get much worse for Coulthard. Ron Dennis won't like the look of that smoke, but it doesn't seem to be slowing the Scot. Massa's first corner misdemeanor results in a 10-second stop-go penalty. The rookie rejoins near the back of the pack. Further up the field, Raikkonen defends the last championship point from Barrichello. The Ferrari number two is in position to bounce. He desperately wants to redeem himself after his poor start. But breaking too late into the Nouvelle Chicane ends his fight back. John Todd remains impassive as the innocent victim lets Barrichello know what he thought of that manoeuvre. Ferrari mobilised the troops for a nose cone change as Raikkonen's McLaren is also in need of attention. The true extent of the damage to these two cars has yet to be seen. Raikkonen looks to have sustained more than just a puncture as Barrichello rejoins in eighth. The Ferrari hierarchy knows that Barrichello will be penalised for his actions, while Raikkonen pays a higher price. His car is totally unbalanced, therefore undrivable. Montoya looks likely to join him. His ailing BMW engine will send shivers down the spine of his teammate. The Williams mechanics know the end is nigh, and sure enough, the V10 looks on the verge of total failure. Patrick Head is anxious to make sure measures have been taken to prevent this from happening to third place Ralf Schumacher. As one major contender disappears, the race leader comes in for his first stop. Michael Schumacher is now the main threat to Coulthard's second Monaco victory. Under the watchful eye of his boss, Coulthard exits the pits around a second ahead. Schumacher has already stopped, so now it's a sprint to the finish.
The fight for 10th is also attracting attention. Panis has Button right on his tail, while Fisichella has risen to 5th. Back in front of the Jordan, Panis prepares for a vigorous defence. Button tries the inside line, Panis refuses to yield, but 2 into 1 won't work. However, that incident was child's play compared to Massa's solo effort. The very lucky Brazilian was eventually able to walk away. I don't know, it's broken something in the car. And I, lo and I, and I lost my brakes and, and then I, it's nothing to do, I crash. It's also a dangerous time for the leaders, as they lap the battle for fourth between Trulli and Fisichella. This allows the Jordan driver to close right up on the Renault. There's now very little time for second and fifth places to make their moves. And it's just about run out. Coulthard rounds the final corner to win the Monaco Grand Prix, with Michael Schumacher only a second behind. The Scot takes his first win of the season and moves up to fourth in the Drivers' Championship. Ralph Schumacher finishes on the podium for the fourth time and Heinz Harold Frentzen earns Arrow's second point of the season. McLaren are back on top and Ron Dennis explains the tactics behind the victory. We knew that Michael had a... Michael's tyre choice was going to give him a little bit of pace in the race, but uh, everything was about getting off the line clean. And of course, getting off the line from the best grid position, and uh, we sacrificed some race pace to get the race win. But the Scot never took the victory for granted. Grand Prix racing can be pretty cruel business at times, and we all know not to count our chickens. But when I came out of that last corner and felt some acceleration, I thought, well, you know, he may be able to pass me now before the checker flag, but at least I'm going to be on the podium. So I was very happy. Coulthard's 12th Formula One victory and one of his most memorable. The Monegasque royal family look on with quiet admiration. That was one of many impressive drives they have witnessed over the years. The victor celebrates, but can he carry this form across the Atlantic? The mighty St. Lawrence River surrounds our next venue, the Circuit de Gilles Villeneuve in Montreal the home of the Canadian Grand Prix. David Coulthard arrives in Canada on a high. Was his Monaco Grand Prix victory his greatest ever? Well, I think that any win, first of all, a driver will, will take as, as being a great achievement. But I think that Monaco is, is recognised as being uh, challenging because if you make a mistake there, of course, you're going to head a barrier. You don't tend to, uh, on a track like that, uh, string a lap together by chance, by getting lucky, uh, you know, maybe getting sideways and getting away with it, as you could do in other tracks. There, you have to, you have to be really tidy. In contrast, the Jaguar boys are struggling. We've no chance with this car, we've no chance, we're wasting our time really, we we know that but we're coming to the races and we've got the new car or the new package coming for Silverstone and then it's, you know, we, we'll see where we are then but until then there's, there's nothing to do. The Ulsterman's qualifying session wasn't a total waste of time, he managed to drag the ailing Big Cat into 14th position. Things are looking up at BAR, technical director Jeff Willis' new aerodynamic package sees Panis up to 11th. Hometown hero Jacques Villeneuve cracks the top ten. The key to a quick time in Montreal is the ability to ride the curbs, and no one did that better than Montoya. The onset of rain ensured the Colombian secured his third pole of the season. As the halfway point of the season beckons, several drivers and teams are hoping for better results. Eddie Jordan will be particularly keen for Sato to keep it on track. But as Montoya and Ron Dennis know, that's only half the battle here. From now to the end of the race is all about strategy and uh, trying to second guess the competition, the use of the safety car, which has happened eight times in the last five years. Can we get a result? Yes. 
Can we win? Probably not. Montoya immediately covers Michael Schumacher's line as Barrichello easily dives down the inside. Raikkonen and Ralph squabble over fourth, and Norbert Haug tells us where his charge ends up. Nicky Lauda focuses on the back of the pack as McNish and De La Rosa go wheel to wheel. Montoya is well aware of Barrichello's presence as the Brazilian executes a less comfortable version of his earlier move to take the lead. The leading pair are on two-stop strategies. It would be safe to assume the world champion is doing the same. The McLaren mechanics will be equally encouraged by the speed of Raikkonen as he holds fourth ahead of Ralf Schumacher. A repeat of the German's win here last year looks increasingly unlikely. You could also get long odds on a trouble-free Canadian Grand Prix for Villeneuve. His fifth retirement in seven attempts is caused by a Honda engine malfunction. It's depressingly predictable for the team and the disconsolate former world champion. His early exit prompts the arrival of the safety car to get the stricken BAR out of the way. Montoya comes in for an impromptu stop. He's in the box, quick, everyone quick. Ties out. This is a smart move. The Colombian will lose a lot less time and places than he would have done under green flag conditions. Not music to the ears of the Ferraris, who have just been picked up by the safety car. Montoya exits alongside sixth place Coulthard, but the pit straight bypass is turn one, allowing an easy passage to fifth. The safety car is in, and Barrichello starts building his lead from scratch. Schumacher looks secure in second, while Raikkonen tries to fend off both Williams. Their team manager, Dickie Stanford, knows that Montoya is being held up by that battle for third. However, Raikkonen is slow into the final corner. Montoya unleashes the power of the BMW V10 and takes third place. Barrichello's strategy of making two stops has been wrecked by the safety car. Radiators full of litter aren't helping either. He rejoins in sixth behind Coulthard. His teammate and race leader is actually on a one-stop strategy and has done very well to keep the top two in sight. Ross Braun gives out the last minute instructions as the world champion enters a crucial stage of his race. Can he keep Montoya behind him? Very rarely do Ferrari get outmaneuvered, but Williams might just have done it. Ross Braun and Michael Schumacher aren't finished yet, and Montoya still has to take his second stop. Fourth place Ralf Schumacher makes his only stop, but the equipment won't play ball. Stop, Ralph. Fuel rig change. The spare fuel rig is utilised as the seconds tick away. Ralph rejoins in seventh, but will need to pit again for the required fuel. <laughs> McNish is hampered by gear selection woes. That and driver error put him out of the race. His fellow countryman takes his only stop. Adrian Newey knows there's very little in it between Coulthard and fifth place Raikkonen. It's desperately close, but the Scot has the edge over the Finn and stays on course for a podium finish. Montoya's mechanics have also done their bit and the Colombian is second behind Schumacher after his second stop. Just as he begins to reel in the leader, disaster strikes. His second consecutive BMW engine failure removes the pressure from Michael Schumacher. 
Second place is still up for grabs. Barrichello uses Sato's lap Jordan to get a run on the Scott, but Coulthard is last on the brakes, a little too late for Barrichello's liking. Trulli's hold on the final point is just as tenuous. Ralph Schumacher needs to salvage something from this race to keep his championship hopes alive. His brother hasn't been under that kind of pressure since Montoya retired and cruises across the line to win the Canadian Grand Prix. Coulthard closed right in on Schumacher to finish second. His teammate also had to slow down thanks to a shortage of fuel, but still finishes fourth. Ralph Schumacher was lucky even to have taken the chequered flag. He keeps a lid on his anger, but two BMW engine failures are certainly nothing to smile about. The German should have been in the fight for third, which was taken by Barrichello. Vissi Keller finishes fifth, with Trulli taking the final point. The battle for second was certainly hard fought. What are the combatants' viewpoints? I know it was very marginal with Rubens and, and um, you know he's expressed that opinion and I'm, I've apologised for squeezing him but I had to I had to pull out of the slipstream from, from Sato and it was always going to be marginal for the, the last chicane and I took a gamble, didn't manage to make it, went through and was fully prepared to let Rubens pass had he made the chicane. When you see somebody going uh, fast uh, on the outside you just uh, don't want to let um, it happen, so he just naturally came come off the brake. So basically, I couldn't make the corner either. But um, I mean, that's that's no point in, in going back there. Despite Barrichello's issues with Coulthard, Ferrari will look back on this race with great relief. Most of their rivals fell by the wayside. Michael Schumacher's sixth win of the season boosts his drivers' championship lead to an enormous 43 points, while his team are almost as secure on top of the constructors' table, leading Williams by 32 points. The St. Lawrence gets swapped for the Rhine as we touch down in Germany for the European Grand Prix. There are few places that can rival the nearby Eiffel Mountains and its surrounding towns for scenery or architecture. The drivers undertake a more business-related form of sightseeing, gathering information on the Nürburgring's new corners that are designed to improve passing opportunities. Hopefully, minus the carnage of the old Castrol S. I don't know yet. Tomorrow we try. I rather prefer the L circuit, and I think it's going to be. It's pretty dangerous, I gotta say, because it's such a slow corner. Now, if somebody breaks a bit late, it's going to be, you know, like playing. Somebody's going to be playing bowling from behind the cars. <laughs> it is very tight compared to to the rest of the circuit, but it's it's good for our car because it's three first gear corners, and uh, it's really really helping the TC. I think just one thing is that, that it's very very bumpy on uh, on breaking into turn one. I think now the track is bigger and it's, it's much more technical. Um, it's, it's quite important for the, the car balance. Uh, also traction, here it's really important, the traction of the car. And, but I think it's, it's not so bad, the new, the new track. On Friday, all that concerned the Brazilian was the World Cup quarter-final against England. It started badly as Brazil went one down. I was really nervous in the, in the match. All that emotion was released when Brazil counter-attacked and sent English spirits into free-fall. Nearly break the Peter Sauber table. Fight! 
Brazil eventually went ahead, but nothing is ever certain until the 90 minutes are up. We was robbed. Montoya boosted the South American feel-good factor, taking his fourth pole of 2002. Ralph Schumacher completed an all-Williams front row, but will those ultra-powerful BMW engines go the distance? We are aiming at having the top engine, and you can only do this if you really go to the edge, right to the edge, and going to the edge means here and there you have to cross the line in order just to know where it is. We have uh, always a little bit more power for each race, but uh, again, the priority was cl clear on uh, reliability, and uh, that was going to count this weekend. That's blatantly obvious to his two drivers as they enviously eye up F1's best package. Both examples will be sitting right behind them on the grid. So far this season, Ferrari have had the edge over Williams on race day. The majority of this capacity crowd are praying for the usual. A lot will depend on this instalment of the tyre war. Can Michelin carry over their qualifying pace? The revised track layout should also make for a fascinating European Grand Prix. Montoya leads the field into the new Castrol S. It holds no fear for Ralph, but hearts will miss beats in the garages. Home turf brings out the aggression in the younger Schumacher as he barges his way through. Jordan also keep it in the family. Any damage, Giancarlo? Any damage? What about tyres? Yeah, I think so. Maybe front wing, I don't know. At the front, Barrichello is past Montoya and pressurises Ralph for the lead. The Ferrari number two makes light work of the Williams, while the Colombian struggles to fend off the world champion. Everything seems to be going Ferrari's way in the early stages and the run-up to the Vidal chicane confirms that as Michael Schumacher takes third place. The Colombian tries to put up a fight, but the prancing horse has bolted, leaving him in the clutches of the McLarens. Pierre Dupasquier puts a brave face on the situation, but at least none of his tyres are in the state of Sato's right rear. Shades of Malaysia for the Jordan team, but this time it's Fissi Keller who's to blame for the early double pit stop. The Japanese rookie has had a troubled season so far, and this unplanned stop isn't going to reverse his fortunes. As the Jordan mechanics try to cope with the unexpectedly high demand, the Schumacher brothers fight over second place. The Williams mechanics fear the worst. The Ferraris are on two-stop strategies, while Ralph has a heavy fuel load. Ross Braun proves his worth again. Michael doesn't need to use his 2001 strong-arm tactics on his brother this year. McLaren's 2002 rivals, Renault, are still giving the English team headaches, with Jensen Button leading the charge. He's gaining on sixth place, Raikkonen. But the Finns' lock-up blows a battle between the up-and-coming young stars. Ross Braun can afford to sit back and relax as the Ferraris pull out a substantial lead. Barrichello heads Schumacher, but will Jean Todt keep it that way? The champion is pushing hard to get on his teammate's tail as we approach the first stops, but maybe he's thinking too far ahead. 
His team principal isn't about to start panicking. The mechanics can help Michael maintain his solid grip on second place. The first stop is up to Ferrari's usual high standards and may have made up for that rare moment of unshoomy like behaviour. Michael leaves the pits comfortably ahead of Ralph. His teammate's position is far from safe as he is stalked by Coulthard. Montoya has handling problems and major rear tyre wear, putting fourth place within reach of Coulthard's McLaren, which is far more Michelin friendly. gets alongside, but that doesn't account for the Colombian's worn-out rubber. Sympathy is a rare commodity in a situation like this. I knew it was a risk to, uh, to go around the outside. Congratulations. I gave you space. You know, my car is fun. I spun. I know that. You hit me. You think I don't know that? Traction control is useless when there's no traction to control, but that won't change Coulthard's opinion in a hurry. The other McLaren looks good for a podium position. Raikkonen's stop sees him ahead of Button, while despite his tyre troubles, Ralph holds fifth. Ferrari's Bridgestones have displayed their usual race day supremacy, but will Barrichello be allowed to drive them to victory? Whatever happens, Schumacher will take another step closer to the title, even if he is beaten by his teammate. Just outside the top ten, Frentzen closes in on Villeneuve. The new section has caused plenty of problems for late breakers and the German is just a passenger. Ferrari had their early dramas, but shrugged them off to earn a convincing 1-2. This time, Rubinho gets his just reward. Fantastic drive, Rubens. Very well done. Super. Grazie, no! Grazie, grazie, grazie a tutti. Barrichello finally wins his second Grand Prix, and Raikkonen now has two Formula One podiums to his credit, while Massa takes the final point. Rubens' victory was assured before he crossed the line. Rose was, was great today, and you know, he came on the radio and said, Rubens, can you do me a favour? Can you win the race? So, thank you. Ross Braun's gift sets up a party atmosphere in the pit lane. With Barrichello's victory and his football team's progress in the World Cup, it's a great time to be a Brazilian. The championship now makes its annual visit to one of its traditional hotbeds in a deceptively tranquil part of rural Northamptonshire. One of the pre-race highlights of the British round is the Grand Prix Ball. The fans' enthusiasm will carry over to the race as thanks to millions of pounds of investment, the spirit-sapping crawl to Silverstone is now a thing of the past.
Does the president of the British Racing Drivers Club think that the new carriageway has ensured the circuit's Formula One future? I think we've done enough, but not enough in reference to what the future will truly hold. Uh, we've got to make better spectator facilities, more restaurants, more bars, more coffee shops. We've got to have better grandstand seating. We've got to have a lot of amenities that we all have these things right now, but not to the level that we could have them. What are the fans' opinions? Very good, yeah. Big improvement. We were over last year and they're definitely a big improvement last year, yeah. Today's traffic was phenomenally brilliant. It's the best we've ever been at Silverstone and the improvements are absolutely amazing. We got in straight off, not a problem. We set off earlier this time, but it was a lot better coming in. Really good. Good facilities. An altogether more light-hearted launch took place at McLaren's futuristic base. The Adventures of Mac and Lauren has been written by Lisa Dennis, wife of team boss Ron. What made her decide to become a children's author? I think it's a thing of combining my two lives because we have three children and introducing them to motor racing and having to see how they enjoy it, it gave me the inspiration to actually put the two worlds together really. Several drivers gave their endorsements, but that wasn't the end of Michael's PR assignments. The Ferrari number no. one gave Finnish football international Sami Hupier a guided tour. For once, Michael's driving skills didn't match his abilities as a host, and the front row was out of reach. His fastest time was eclipsed by Barrichello, who looked odds on for pole into the last few minutes. Hopefully nobody put any money on Alex Jung, who languished outside the 107% threshold for the second time. The Malaysian's non-qualification was ensured by Montoya's last-minute effort. That's his fourth consecutive pole position. But can he finally make it count on race day? Carl Fogarty, Samantha Mumba and Nigel Mansell are all part of the celebrity lineup at Silverstone. All eyes are on Montoya. His struggle to convert poles to wins puts extra pressure on the normally laid-back Colombian. Some of that stress is about to disappear courtesy of Barrichello's appalling luck. Ruben has stalled. Ruben has stalled. <laughs> The Brazilian and the team have precious little time to correct the problem. But Formula One mechanics are always capable of minor miracles. However, the number of mobile chicanes has gone up from one to 20. Montoya consolidates pole ahead of the Schumacher brothers, while Massa goes for a suicidal wide line. The Brazilian manages to continue, but has lost valuable time on the leaders. Michael Schumacher begins to wind in Montoya as Raikkonen puts third-placed Ralph Schumacher under pressure. The leading pair stretch their advantage. Back in the midfield, Panis has a look down the outside of Heidfeld, who keeps a solid grip on 10th position. Barrichello isn't far off that battle as he lines up 13th placed Irvine. Unlike Ross Braun, the fans' eyes are glued to the three-way battle for third between Ralph and the two McLarens. Barrichello's progress also fights for their attention. He's up to 11th at Panis' expense. His BAR teammate concedes ninth place just as easily. Grip will be at a premium soon thanks to the intense drizzle. Salo has already reached that point. The Finn loses two places and rejoins 11th. Back with the leaders and Montoya is struggling valiantly to keep Schumacher behind him. 
The Germans' Bridgestones excel in these lower temperatures, and Montoya will need all of his defensive skills to fight off this attack. Frentzen is battling just as hard in 13th, but there's not enough grit to be that ambitious. The rain is intensifying. Surely tyre stops aren't far away. Masses just has his mind made up for him. Montoya won't be too far behind. Conditions are nigh on impossible for the race leader. I don't know, I can't even keep it on the track. But I don't think it's going to keep raining. OK, come in anyway, come in anyway. It's crunch time for the mechanics, as most of the field feel the time is right for wet weather tyres. Montoya and the rest of the Michelin runners know their intermediate tyre lacks mileage. Full wets are the only option. Advantage Schumacher and all those on the Bridgestone Intermediates. Coulthard stays out and takes the lead, but dry rubber is the wrong option at the moment. The Scots' tenuous hold on the lead is broken by Montoya. McLaren's unusual non-reaction to events can be in part put down to radio interference. Schumacher is quickly past the Scot into second, and amazingly, Coulthard still doesn't pit. That decision costs him dearly at club. The race leader is also on the ragged edge. It's Michelin Wets versus Bridgestone Intermediates, and there can be only one winner. To reinforce the Colombian's opinion, comeback kid Barrichello breezes past into second. Two other Michelin runners squabble over sixth. It's Renault versus McLaren as Raikkonen makes a move on Button. Ralph Schumacher is next in line and loses fifth. Trulli does no better, and the Finn is up to fourth, while Ralph comes in for his second stop with a tyre dilemma. The rain has stopped, but Ralph still opts for full wets. Any advantages that choice may have given him are wiped out by faulty fuel rigs. Both designated and spare rigs have malfunctioned. Ralph is sent on his way in the hope of pitting again in the very near future. McLaren are also experiencing fuel rig problems. In a desperate attempt to regain lost time, Coulthard goes back out on dry tyres. Barrichello's race has hardly been free of misfortune either, and that spin allows Montoya to close. The Colombian's full wet tyres have practically become slicks, giving him a slight edge over Barrichello. While that battle rages on, there's plenty of action further down the order. The battle for second is now fought on dry tyres. Barrichello seizes his chance at Cops. The British-American racing team have also made the most of this wet, dry race. Villeneuve has reached the dizzy heights of fourth, while David Richards keeps his fingers crossed for Panis, who is also in position to boost team morale. Michael Schumacher always keeps Ferrari spirits high. His seventh win of the season is a milestone victory.
good job, Michael. Superb today. Well done. Broke the jinx of Silverstone. Barrichello salvages second, while BAR earned their first points of the season. The whole team was impeccable. You know, the drivers, technicians, everybody. Fantastic job. Schumacher's Bridgestone Intermediates helped him win his first British Grand Prix on the track, having secured his 1998 win in the pit lane. Ross Braun receives gratitude in spades as his strategic skills played a big part in Schumacher's victory. He also had a hand in Barrichello's amazing recovery drive. I'm lucky to be here and to, to finish second really. I mean, I had a, a hell of a race today and uh, quite an uh, enjoyable one in terms of fighting, overtaking, so I'm, I'm happy. Tremendous, absolutely vintage this is. <laughs> Great. From one historic race to another, Formula One returns to France. The Manicour circuit is situated in the Nevers region in the heart of France, but come the end of the race you might think you'd travelled back in time and space to last August's Hungarian Grand Prix. Schumacher can win the driver's title with a record six races remaining by finishing in first or second position with the following scenarios. All thoughts of breaking Nigel Mansell's 1992 record were put on hold when Giancarlo Fisichella embedded his Jordan into the tyre barriers. The Italian lost the front wing when he took to the kerbs at over 170 miles per hour. The FIA's chief medical officer, Professor Sid Watkins, advised Fisichella to miss qualifying and therefore the race as a precaution. He's fine, he's all right. And now we're going to the Never uh, Hospital to make a, a scan to be 100% sure that he's OK. Fisichella gave the thumbs up while Jordan searched for a last minute replacement. However, they were forced to run just one car on race day. Due to their ongoing financial crisis, the Arrows team didn't seem to be in a hurry to do much at all. <laughs> Isn't it amazing what you can find to do when there is nothing to do? The reason we're not running is because the management have taken a conscious decision on the advice we were given by the people who are negotiating the deal. Both cars made an appearance during qualifying, primarily to avoid disciplinary action from the FIA. How is that? That's what it was, 18 fourth. Now you've got to hope that Michael goes fast. Both cars ended up outside the 107% threshold. Mission accomplished, the team went home. Meanwhile, Michael Schumacher was trying too hard to get the job done. He had that time disallowed for missing the Imola chicane. This set up a battle between the world champion and the new king of qualifying, going for his fifth consecutive pole position. Once again, Montoya was untouchable over one lap. OK, you pay one again. For me, the biggest pleasure is, is to get the fifth pole and, you know, such a close fight. When Michael was doing his time and they were disallowing his time, you know, talking to my to my engineer, I said, just, you know, let's try to save a set. And, you know, we, there's no real chance we're going to get the ball here. They're too quick. And, you know, just, you know, just keep doing it. And boom, boom, boom. The time just came down. The pressure is on for Montoya to win his first race of the season. Meanwhile, the winners and losers of qualifying psych themselves up for the French Grand Prix. Barrichello has lost out even before the race has started. His engine refuses to fire up. He must now start from the back of the grid and that's the best case scenario.
The F2002 gets rushed to the pit lane for emergency surgery, while the race starts minus the frustrated Brazilian. Massa gets a suspiciously good start. Montoya covers Schumacher and the Renaults look for early scalps. Honda's race takes an early nosedive as Sato and Panis collide. De La Rosa's evasive manoeuvre also involves a gravelly moment. The only French driver can kiss a points finish goodbye. Barrichello's prospects of starting are even worse. This is a repeat of the Spanish Grand Prix and once was clearly enough. The surviving Ferrari attacks for the lead. Michael is slightly ahead but doesn't have the inside line and Montoya's desperately late braking opens the door for Raikkonen. He can't get too comfortable though as Schumacher retaliates. That bit of action was great encouragement for McLaren but this replay will be bad news for Sauber. Massa clearly jumped the start and is handed a drive-through penalty. The Brazilian won't give up easily, but driving over the pit lane exit line will present another setback. The race leader comes in for a scheduled stop. Montoya drops to fourth and Michael Schumacher takes the lead. Ferrari's favourite son increases the pace as he approaches his first stop. Eddie Jordan's sole entry is that much closer to the limit. Chronic understeer ends Sato's and Jordan's forgettable weekend. Panis is also out, courtesy of damage from his first lap collision with the Japanese rookie. The race leader is in for his first set of fresh rubber and fuel and temporarily drops two places. Another seamless stop from Ferrari, but the exit leaves a lot to be desired. Like Massa, Michael will be punished for that momentary lapse. This drive-through penalty could wipe out any hopes of clinching the Drivers' Championship in France. But Schumacher only drops to third and narrowly avoids another penalty. Now only Montoya and Raikkonen stand in his way. Fernando Alonso has been announced as Button's replacement at Renault for 2003. The Brit has rebounded from the bad news and looks like earning more championship points. A podium finish is Ralph's target as he pits for his second stop from fourth position. Ralph loses a place and will rejoin behind Montoya, but he is sure to be pushed further back after failing to resist the attraction of the white line. Irvine will reach rock bottom much sooner. The Jaguar driver was in with a shout of the team's first points since Australia, but rear wing failure neuters the big cat. The prancing horse is galloping towards the driver's title. Second place Schumacher is in for his final stop behind Raikkonen, who then falls behind Coulthard. DC's yet to stop, so this is effectively the battle for the lead. The Finn now leads the sprint to the line and Ron Dennis feels 2002's second victory is in the bag. Raikkonen has never been under this kind of pressure before. Will the ice-cool Finn show his first sign of weakness? Coulthard comes in for his final stop. A good performance by the McLaren mechanics could see him have an impact on the fight for first place. Raikkonen is starting to ease away as his teammate rejoins the track, but he comes out behind Schumacher and becomes the fourth white line offender. Raikkonen is now the only obstacle between Schumacher and a fifth world title.
However, a spanner and waved yellow flags are thrown into the works by McNish's Toyota. There's oil on the track, right in the path of the race leader. The Finn goes wide and Schumacher takes the advantage. But does the Finn's mistake cancel out the no overtaking rule? Ferrari ignore the controversy as they prepare to welcome the world champion. Michael Schumacher wins the French Grand Prix to claim his fifth world title, equaling the record of legendary Argentinian Juan Manuel Fangio. The mood couldn't be more different at McLaren. The Toyota blew up and there was no oil flag at all. I don't know what the interpretation of the stewards is going to be, but the fact is he entered a, with a red, a yellow flag. Michael overtook before there was a green one. That's what we believe. It was not the right flag displayed. The yellow flag was out. He was overtaken under the yellow flag. That incident couldn't be further from Michael Schumacher's mind as his monumental achievement begins to sink in. The best driver, the best team and the best car have combined to crush the opposition in record time. Old rivals McLaren are bitterly disappointed despite a double podium finish while Jensen Button takes the final point behind both Williams. But that's not the headline story at Manicour. I've never been good at, at these moments to find uh, appropriate words, in all honesty. It's, it just has overcome me. I didn't think about the championship all weekend, honestly, because I somehow felt that it's not going to happen here. Suddenly, when I was leading and feeling that's going to be the championship, I think that was the worst sort of five laps I have had in my career. The sort of outbreak I had was uh, yeah, pretty pretty heavy and that's when I realised how much pressure probably I was under. Those five laps must have been very hard for Kimi Raikkonen. The car was great, the team was uh, making very good uh, pit stops, everything was working fine. It was just my mistake that we lost the race, uh, maybe the most disappointed race in my life but uh, that's the way how it goes and uh, next time I hope so we can win. The Finn has plenty of time to put that right, but at the moment he's in the shadow of a Formula One legend. Michael wins the driver's title with six rounds to go, but only four points separate second to fifth. Next on Ferrari's agenda is the constructors' title. They lead Williams by 62 points. This party is likely to go on all the way to Germany. Michael Schumacher won't have much time to digest his remarkable achievement as he returns home for the second race in a week. Germany's favourite son will doubtless be familiar with the picturesque town of Heidelberg, but much less so with the redesigned Hockenheim circuit. Designer Hermann Tilke has changed it almost beyond recognition. It must be 100% different because uh, we have not so much space now for uh, the long straights. And, um, but I think it's, it's quite good. The, the aim was to bring more spectators in and to have a very limited space. This was a problem. But normally I'm, I'm very nervous before and the night before I don't sleep so well. But uh, now uh, the first cars were running and it was quite good. I'm pleased. I quite like it. I think, uh, um, you know, I gotta say that I'm, I'm in favor of it. Uh, even though 
the old one was such a good one for me and I, I, I used to enjoy it very much. I must say that um, you have some corners that will allow you to, to, to have a go in terms of overtaking. Uh, it's a little bit bumpy in some areas which will make um, the car difficult to set up, uh, especially for qualify. But, you know, I can see that uh, we can have good racing here. Yeah, well, I was a fan of the old circuit, so I was always going to be, you know, potentially a little bit negative for the, for the new one. But in actual fact, in the, the few laps I've done, it's, it's got a, an interesting flow to it. I think they've done a very good job. I enjoy it. It's much better than the old circuit. It's a lot safer and it's better for the fans. It's better for Formula One. And as for me as a driver, it's, it's better. I think they've done a very good job. The general trend to have a slow corner, a long straight into a slow corner, that's something that comes from the drivers to actually create overtaking possibilities. All motorsport fans will welcome that, but Schumacher's Red Army are so focused on their hero, it's doubtful whether they'd notice much action further down the order. The world champion was in scintillating form during qualifying as he looked to break Montoya's pole streak. Part one of a triumphant homecoming is in the bag. Michael was pushed hard by Ralph, though, and for the first time since USA 2001, we've got an all Schumacher front row. That ensures a full turnout from the Schumacher Appreciation Society on race day. Their sparring partner endures the novelty of the second row, while one place further back in fifth, Raikkonen wants to put the disappointment of France behind him. The front row moves away cleanly, but Montoya quickly loses out to Raikkonen. Any piece of tarmac will do for Irvine as he retrieves the racing line. Frenson will do well to rescue his home race prospects after stalling on the grid. Meanwhile, De La Rosa's out following a transmission problem. Michael's searing pace looks too hot for his brother to handle. Barrichello is third, followed by Raikkonen and Montoya. The battle for fourth is one of the season's most intriguing, as Formula One's brightest young stars get set to lock horns. The other McLaren is on the offensive. Coulthard powers past Trulli into sixth. Flavio Briatore's patience will be tested further as Trulli has developed a tyre problem that lightens Olivier's workload. A quick demotion to the back of the field looks on the cards for the Italian. But that's only the start of Renault's woes. An engine problem sees Button a lap down and Trulli was forced to pit. The Italian is quickly back out, but gets in the way of the battle for second. Trulli allows Barrichello to close right up on Ralph Schumacher. Second place in the championship is still up for grabs and the Brazilian wants to contribute to a Ferrari clean sweep. However, Ralph will be even more fired up on home turf. Fisichella is equally inspired. The Italian is in the points and a smooth first stop could ensure he's there at the finish. Sadly, the clutch and the right front wheel team up to destroy those lofty aspirations. Fisichella is now a lap behind the leaders thanks to this frustrating delay. Massa will experience a similar feeling as Sauber's team orders come into focus. 
Felipe, let Nick pass immediately. The rookie reluctantly complies with the rather brutal command and there is sure to be an uncomfortable atmosphere within the Swiss team after the race. Trulli's reluctance to let Ralph through results in interference from a higher level. Gully of drive-through penalty, drive-through penalty. This punishment rubs salt into Renault's wounds. Flavio Briatore's already seriously injured patience is strained still further. Their more experienced rivals have been relatively untroubled, but the French team's tyre-eating disorder wasn't an isolated case. Luckily, Raikkonen's left rear blowout didn't send him on a collision course. However, it's debatable whether he'll make it back to the pits. All that delaminated rubber will be hammering the bodywork and possibly interfering with other parts of the McLaren. The shredded Michelin finally bails out and Raikkonen loses even more time. The outlook has brightened slightly as the Finn finds sanctuary in the pits. But his race is now nothing more than a well-publicised test session. Hannes is also suffering from a lack of grip, but his spin hides a more fundamental problem. The Frenchman was running in sixth until his Honda engine decided enough was enough. As usual, there are no such problems for Michael Schumacher. The German has never won his home race in a Ferrari, but that anomaly looks likely to be put right in the near future. Ferrari's focus shifts to the battle for second between Ralf Schumacher and Barrichello. The Brazilian's hold on a podium position may be broken by a reluctant fuel flap. They've got it open, but those wasted seconds put him back in fourth. Raikkonen's status isn't quite as critical until he reaches the final turn. The pounding from the blown tyre damaged his undertray and a brake duct. The fact that he's kept his seat at McLaren for next season just about makes up for his seventh retirement. The Williams mechanics still have work to do. Ralph needs more air for the pneumatic valve system and this could forfeit a family one-two. Montoya moves up to second and Barrichello is too close for comfort. A Schumacher 1-3 is still on the cards. Barrichello's fuel flap drama sees him restricted to three championship points. Willy Weber leads the celebrations for both his clients, the first of which is about to take his record equaling ninth victory of the season. Michael Schumacher wins the German Grand Prix, his first win at Hockenheim since 1995. Juan Pablo Montoya inherited second ahead of Ralph and Barrichello, while Sauber's team orders robbed seventh-placed Massa of a championship point. It's difficult to take anything away from Michael Schumacher this season. No Formula One records are safe from the five-time world champion. His army of supporters make their way to Budapest. Hungry to see if their hero can win a staggering 10th Grand Prix of the season. From the Buda Hills on the west to Pest on the east of the Danube, Budapest is a city with a rich diversity of cultures and architecture. The city has become increasingly popular as a European tourist destination and is a fascinating blend of old and new.
Nearly 20 kilometres from downtown Budapest is the Hungara Ring, home of the Hungarian Grand Prix, the only race in Eastern Europe. One man who wasn't racing was Minardi driver Alex Jung. The Malaysian has failed to qualify three times this season and will be replaced by Britain's Anthony Davidson for two races. How did the VAR test driver feel about being thrown in at the deep end? Well, it was just over a week ago now and uh, I was on holiday in Finland uh, with my girlfriend and uh, and yeah, I got a call from uh, a journalist saying, oh, what's this about Minardi Drive? And I was thinking, no, <laughs> you're, totally, you're way off there. And, uh, but what had happened before I went there, I told my manager not to talk about racing at all. I just wanted a week away, you know, and just forget about racing for a while. And uh, I, he respected that. He said he would only tell me if uh, it was, you know, set in stone, and it wasn't at that time. So uh, I asked, you, you didn't hesitate, I guess? No way, no. I mean, we grabbed it with both hands, the opportunity, and I think anyone would have done as well. Davidson hopes his presence will put him in the frame for a full-time drive next year. Michael Schumacher doesn't have to worry about his future and took provisional pole halfway through qualifying. But even five times world champions can struggle to improve their time. Instead, it was Barrichello who snatched his third pole position of the season. And then went even quicker. The absence of arrows in Hungary shortly after the announcement that Frentzen had been released from his contract prompted intense speculation about the team's future. Rumours about Jordan's future finally came to a head. At the end of this year, uh, Honda will be focusing all of its efforts uh, with British American Racing and um, not with Jordan any longer. But Eddie Jordan pulled yet another rabbit out of the hat. Last night it was really quite a long, exhaustive night because there were documents doing and throwing here and um, it got signed, the contract that I've been waiting for for some time, and that is that... Uh, Ford and Jordan will be together and what the race and the cars that you will see here will be Jordan Ford's this time next year uh, and for a three-year contract. With his future secured, Eddie Jordan can now focus on the race. Ferrari target the constructors title from the front row, while Coulthard will need all his skill and experience to climb up from 10th. Ralph's start gives Ross Broad a fright, while Rubens is away and clear. Montoya, the Renaults and the Saubers argue over fifth, and Jano Trulli draws the short straw. Raikkonen snatches eighth place and further adds to Trulli's miserable first three corners. At the front, the Ferraris exert their authority, and there's little Ralph can do about it at the moment. Rubens drives home the advantage with Michael in tow. Fisichella is keeping up with Ralph, ahead of Massa and Button. Coulthard steals the position off Heidfeld, but 10th is well below expectations. Right at the back, Davidson is free to learn without that kind of pressure. While the raw rookie looks to impress, the veteran frontrunners continue to dominate. Mechanical problems still beset VAR. Transmission failure takes out Villeneuve. Back on track, Montoya clings on to seventh ahead of Raikkonen. The Finn snatches the racing line, while Montoya goes on a destructive detour. He's quickly into the pits for a checkup. The Williams has become difficult to drive. There are several possible causes, but Patrick Head is 150% sure he has the right answer. He had no pump 
picture at all. So it is purely the handling due to the aerodynamic changes. He had no part. The battle for the last championship point is just as intense as Raikkonen closes in on Button. Like the rest of us, Ron Dennis savours this battle of the future stars. But putting a wheel on the grass guarantees it's all too short. Perhaps he was trying too hard to impress future employers BAR. Michael Schumacher might not have to fight so hard given Ferrari's undoubted superiority. This stop gives second place to his brother. Ferrari's two-stop strategy is working like a charm once again. Barrichello has borne the brunt of the team's race reliability problems this season, but he seems to be leaving his bad luck behind him. Marinello's trusty lieutenant rejoins the race ahead of Michael. Montoya remains a lap down. Ralph takes the lead in the interim, but he's yet to make his stop. However, third place is the best he could hope for, given the red car's recent form. The highs of Monaco and Canada must seem an age away to Coulthard. The lower reaches of the points are becoming uncomfortably familiar to McLaren. He had been running fifth, but rejoins in seventh ahead of Trulli, who is still paying for his awful start. McLaren are still trying to recover from their poor qualifying performance, and Coulthard prolongs the agony. Formula One's latest Brit has been attracting attention with his smooth transition to the big league, but inexperience finally gets to Davidson and takes him on a one-way trip to retirement. From the trials and tribulations of a new recruit, it's back to the front with Formula One's best. Michael is now very close, obliterating the lap record on the way. Their constructor's title is about to be signed, sealed and delivered. The architect of Ferrari's dominance waits patiently on the pit wall as Barrichello crosses the line to win the Hungarian Grand Prix. The Brazilians' second win of the season helps Ferrari to their fourth consecutive constructors' title. The travelling Tifosi rejoice. Marinello's triple crown is almost complete. All that's left is to secure second place for the ever popular Rubinho. Ralph Schumacher was best of the rest behind Ferrari's fifth 1-2 of the season. McLaren got both cars into the points, while Fisichella claimed a valuable top six result for Jordan. Despite being untroubled by their rivals, both Ferraris were setting a blistering pace up front. I saw his pit board there, but not showing, so he wasn't behind. All of a sudden, I saw that car coming in so fast, he really put a fast lap. And uh, so it's just because I told him I put a fast lap in, in, uh, in Silverstone. So it was, it was a really good lap. There are now just five points separating the three-way battle for second in the Drivers' Championship. And the upcoming power circuits should give Ralph and Montoya their best opportunities. Despite Williams' best efforts, their team has just over half the points of their championship winning rivals. Ferrari head to the Belgian Grand Prix with both titles in the bag. But how will the prancing horse fare when Schumacher and Co's contracts have expired in 2004? I'm very confident that there's some very good people at Ferrari who can start to take a bit more responsibility in the future. And they're people who've been with us all the time I've been there, so I've got a pretty good measure of them. And I hope and I don't think Ferrari will have a sudden abrupt drop off in performance. Uh, and I don't think that everybody's going to leave at the same time. We don't want to damage Ferrari in that way, so I don't think any of us will, will want to cause an abrupt change in the fortunes of Ferrari. Michael Schumacher was certainly keen to maintain the continuity of success during qualifying. Amazingly, this was his first pole position at the daunting Spa-Francorchamps circuit. 
It held no fear for Kimi Raikkonen, even when entering a thick cloud of Honda V10 smoke. Using the trail of oil as a guide, he kept his foot to the floor and emerged unscathed. The inspirational Finn eventually set the second fastest time. Although he probably would have endorsed Raikkonen's bravery, Montoya certainly didn't appreciate the Finn's lack of awareness. The Colombian felt that Raikkonen had obstructed his line into the bus stop chicane. As usual, Montoya, who qualified fifth, wasn't shy about letting his feelings known. What a idiot! Alan McNish and Mika Salo were probably just as frustrated when they heard that they would not be driving for Toyota in 2003. There are exact reasons behind the decision to replace both drivers. I think you've really got to ask Toyota directly themselves. We felt that we need to you know, to, 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 to get different angles and things it, it, and, and to get a little bit of new motivation into the operation. Especially from the technical side, we felt that we need to, to have a different view. Are the rumours of Salo's impending retirement true? If something comes up before January or something, for sure I'm interested. Because I know myself so well, I will get bored in uh, probably three weeks and then I want to do something. and. For sure, my wife in the home don't want to see me at home every day, so I better find something. Olivier Panis will fill one of the vacant seats. Does he have any sympathy for the ousted drivers? I don't care. I mean, it's difficult to say something to them. I mean, the Formula One sometimes is the Formula One. Uh, I think so. Uh, Mika is... I, I don't know really what's happened. It's not my problem. But the, 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 what I want to say to them is he's doing a good job, to be honest. But uh, for me, it's a different approach for the team. Massa is also looking for alternative employment next year. Heidfeld's new teammate will be Heinz Harald Frensen. The pole sitter focuses on breaking another record, under the expert eye of its holder. Good luck with winning the 10th race today and beating my world record. <laughs> Raikkonen has beaten his qualifying personal best and lines up second. Revenge for France is a high priority for McLaren. Offence turns to defence in an instant as Raikkonen tries to cut off Barrichello. But the Brazilian has the best line into La Source and tucks in behind Michael as Ralph and Coulthard stake their claims for fifth place. The 20 car field approaches the daunting Eau Rouge corner. As hopes remain high in the McLaren camp, a good overtaking opportunity looms. The 200 mile per hour all German engine battle resolves itself in Coulthard's favour for now, but McLaren's gain is short lived. Raikkonen caught the slide well, but is now behind Montoya. 11 places further back, Massa is determined to show Peter Sauber the error of his ways at Heidfeld's expense. Just in front of that internal battle, Fisichella and Villeneuve fight for Honda honours. The Canadian carries superior momentum and is right in the Jordan slipstream. But the Italian does whatever it takes to stay ahead. Villeneuve gets another chance at the beginning of the lap as Fisichella's wide line gift wraps 13th place. The former champion's future teammate is coasting towards retirement. Engine failure marks Button's third consecutive non-finish. Reliability has been a major problem for the rebranded team in 2002. BAR has also struggled with mechanical gremlins, but Villeneuve shows no sign of frailty and takes 11th position from McNish. The race order is primed for a shake-up as it's time for the initial stops, with Michael Schumacher the first of the front-runners.
Montoya's hold on third could be broken by the McLaren mechanics. Coulthard could rise as high as third. The final podium position is beyond him for the moment, but he manages to grab fourth from his teammate. Michael Schumacher briefly relinquished the lead to Barrichello during the pit stops, but regained it a lap later and quickly sets a pace that nobody else can match. And that includes his own teammate. Davidson finds his own speed too hot to handle. I just pushed too hard around one of the fastest corners on the track and just kicked a wheel onto the kerb and game over. While the rookie is quickly forgiven, the quest for the record number of wins in a season goes on. Schumacher has already had his second stop and takes the lead when Barrichello goes for his final set of tyres and fuel. Ron Dennis has been monitoring Raikkonen's progress closely since the Finns' last stop, but would he have seen this coming? His latest Mercedes engine failure contributes to his 57% retirement rate. Raikkonen's demise puts championship points within reach of Trulli and Ralf Schumacher. The Renault pit wall is a hive of apprehension, and with good reason. Spa's engine-breaking nature claims another victim and ruins Renault's weekend. But their loss is Jaguar's gain. P6, Eddie, P6, keep pushing, keep pushing. Suspension failure means pushing is out of the question for De La Rosa. While the English team cursed the give-and-take nature of the Belgian Grand Prix, Villeneuve is behind Fisichella after his final stop. It's a state of affairs that's soon blown asunder. Fisichella wins the prize for the season's most spectacular engine failure. The competitive fire still burns bright within Ferrari's number one as another record is about to be broken. Ten victories in a season with three rounds to go underline Schumacher's domination of F1 2002. This season's been nowhere near as kind to Jaguar. The big cat dines out on the scraps left by its rivals thanks to Irvine's strong drive to sixth. Good race, Eddie. Well done. Fantastic car. I mean, unbelievable. Ooh, thank you for all of this. Congratulations from the former joint record holder complete the equation. He encouraged me to, uh, to move up one step and uh, so I did. So thanks for that, uh, Nigel. Uh, I hope you feel not too sorry about it. The world champion's sixth win at Spa was one of his best ever. It's fitting that he breaks the record at the circuit on which he made his F1 debut 11 years ago. Barrichello had a lonely race to second, while Coulthard ran out of laps to reel in Montoya. Can anybody stop the Ferrari celebrations as Formula One returns to Italy? Milan embodies culture, vitality, energy and, of course, fine food and wine. But there is much more to the city than just clothes and beautiful people. A few miles north of the city is Monza, a circuit seeped in history, the home of the Italian Grand Prix and popular with a Ferrari fan or two. Safety is a constant concern and Sauber was the first team to use the head and neck support safety collar or hand system in a race environment. It was designed to restrict the forward movement of a driver's head in the event of an accident. Plans to introduce the device had been delayed after several drivers complained that it was uncomfortable to wear. Boost you saw coming from the hunt system, but it's already a lot better now. We, we changed the system, we made a special shape for me, we put a lot of foam on it, so you can imagine how bad it was before. 
but uh, to uh, drive it in Monza, it's OK. I think I'm going to use it tomorrow again. Alex Jung returned fresh from a two-race break, while Eddie Irvine proved that Jaguar had made a giant leap since Australia. He silenced his critics to put his radically improved R3 sixth on the grid. Michael Schumacher may have been breaking records, but Montoya has been the star of qualifying with six pole positions. The battle lines are drawn to see who really is the fastest man in Formula One. Two of the finest try to break Keki Rosberg's 17-year standard for the quickest ever lap. But with an unprecedented 19,000 RPM, this is the fastest man in Formula One. A nasty incident between Sato and Raikkonen saw qualifying stopped in the closing minutes. Sato had been on a flying lap, while Raikkonen was on his first lap out of the pits. Whether the Finns saw the Jordan or not was subject to heated debate. However, the FIA deleted his fastest time, leaving him sixth on the grid, elevating Irvine to fifth. With an average speed of over 161 miles per hour, it is Montoya who produces the fastest lap of all time, to the delight of the team. It'll be hard to rain on the Tafosi's parade, especially with 53 laps of super fast action in prospect. Former Maranello favourite Eddie Irvine lines up a season's best fifth. He may have to avoid the fallout from any front row fireworks. That won't be a problem for Trulli, but Renault's impressive launch control could save him from home race humiliation. Trulli prepares himself for mission highly unlikely. Hopefully his engine won't self-destruct. Montoya has Michael covered and holds the inside line, but doesn't account for Ralph's lightning start. Neither will give any quarter, but the Retifilio doesn't cater for stubborn teammates. Further back, Coulthard runs into Raikkonen, but up front, Ralph's shortcut will only pay short-term dividends. Ralph races on under a cloud ahead of Montoya, Barrichello, Michael Schumacher and Raikkonen. Minus a front wing, Coulthard's McLaren is a minor inconvenience to Trulli, who's passed eight cars in eight corners. Coulthard will need the same amount of determination after his pit stop. This short but needless delay ruins any hopes of a repeat of his win here five years ago. Almost a minute ahead, Barrichello hassles Montoya, while the Colombian looks for a way past Ralph. The race stewards intervene to ease his passage into the lead, as Williams are obliged to insist that Ralph moves over. Barrichello takes advantage of the open door and sets his sights on the lead. The superiority of the Ferrari is blatantly obvious as the Brazilian blasts past Montoya, while Ralph's BMW engine expires at high speed. Chief Operations Engineer Sam Michael prepares himself for an exasperating race as Barrichello quickly leaves Montoya behind. Late braking sees the Colombian recover some of the leader's advantage, but a trip across the kerbs forces a rearguard action. Once again, Montoya is easily dispatched by a Ferrari, going the long way round. Schumacher's move starts the celebrations in the garage and the stands, and Montoya will have difficulty repeating his 2001 Monza victory.
BAR aren't short on optimism either as Panis closes on seventh placed Sarlo. The Frenchman gets a good run out of the Lesmos and with the help of a lighter fuel load puts one over his future employers. Toyota's once promising race quickly disintegrates when McNish is forced into retirement with broken suspension. The atmosphere is far more tense in the Sauber garage as De La Rosa's Jaguar lines up 12th placed Massa. The Spaniard is that bit later on the brakes but will ultimately pay the price for his ambition. Massa immediately retaliates and gets help from an unexpected source. Pedro, let Massa pass, let Massa pass. Pedro complies, but Massa takes the racing line too early. The mechanics are on standby, but he won't make it that far. Besides, he could do with walking off his anger. His frustrations might be eased when he hears that Massa is out and in trouble. If you see Felipe, uh, the steward, the, he should leave the race like the stewards want to see him after the race. Truly will be guaranteed a warm reception if he keeps up his pace. He's currently in seventh and a quick pit stop could put him in the points. Yet another engine failure rules Raikkonen out of a top six result. The Finn has borne the brunt of McLaren's problems this season. His fellow countryman has hit the dizzy heights of fourth. This is Salo's best performance since Brazil. Can the veteran finish his season with a flourish? He rejoins 12th behind the Renaults, but is sure to raise the ire of the stewards by crossing the white line. Montoya's had his sole stop and continues to hold third until chassis problems break his grip on a podium position. He makes it back to the pits, but all hopes of finishing second in the Drivers' Championship are fading fast. Even the chance of a few more points disappears as Montoya retires for the fourth time this season. With their main threat gone, the Ferraris can practically cruise to the finish, with Barrichello leading after the final stops. Schumacher looks to be happy to let Barrichello take every Ferrari driver's dream result. They could be joined on the podium by the sole surviving Jaguar. Eddie Irvine has Panis right in his slipstream, but hardly bothers to defend his position. The reason for the Ulsterman's lack of resistance will become apparent very shortly. The Frenchman is in for his last stop and needs a quick turnaround to stay in the top six. David Richards would like the title of the best Honda Power team and his mechanics could put it within reach. They get the veteran out, sixth behind both Renaults. Jean Todd hasn't experienced that sort of tension since the early stages of the race. His team achieves Italy's dream result. Rubens Barrichello leads home a Ferrari 1-2 at Monza. The Brazilian all but secures second place in the Drivers' Championship as Irvine's manager, Enrico Zanarini, leads the Jaguar celebrations. Felipe Massa becomes the first driver to receive the disciplinary measures introduced in Brazil for causing an avoidable accident. Eddie Irvine's mum certainly won't be chastising her son after his first top three finish since Monaco last year. The longer you're away, the sweeter it is when you get up there, that's for sure. Um, you know, it's when I was a Ferrari, I was up there every other weekend, it was boring. To get up there today, you know, I picked two great races to get on the podium for Jaguar. Monaco in here, you couldn't ask for better, the Italian fans here, it was just incredible. Barrichello, Schumacher and Irvine are about to get a whole lot closer to the Italian fans, courtesy of Monza's innovative new podium. It's the first time this season that a team other than Ferrari, McLaren or Williams has a representative in the top three. And everybody wants a taste of the champagne.
The Ferrari victory parade shows no sign of ending. Can their rivals fight back at the home of American motorsport? Indianapolis is one of America's fastest growing metropolitan areas and is a city full of energy and enthusiasm. It's a city on the move, but it has its natural sights as well. The Motor Speedway is a mecca of motorsport and the largest spectator sporting facility in the world. The locals are proud to play host to the US Grand Prix. Welcome to the Indianapolis Grand Prix. Sauber welcomed Heinz Harald Frentzen back to the team as a one-off replacement for Massa in a bid to avoid the penalty that would have seen him start from near the back of the grid. Frentzen's main problem was fitting into a cockpit built for the slight pairing of Heidfeld and Massa. It's a little bit tight, the steering wheel is a little bit too close to me, but uh, the seat and as that is not too bad actually. It was good enough to make a decision to race here. He wasn't the only one to debut a new car. Indy Racing League driver Sarah Fisher qualified on pole position in the Kentucky round of the championship. She became the first woman to drive an F1 car for 10 years when she drove the spare McLaren. I can't say enough to Tag Heuer and McLaren, Team McLaren, for giving me this opportunity to uh, see what one of these cars is like and it definitely gives me a new respect for the drivers out there. They definitely are very quick and um, twitchy and vibrating and they give you every sense of uh, sensation that a world championship car should. Barrichello experienced the worst sensation you can get from a world championship car on Friday when his Ferrari crashed into the infamous Indy wall, leaving the team with the task of rebuilding his car. It looks like we lost uh, uh, rear uh, pressure on the tyre and uh, I mean it was just a, a sudden move. The car went sideways and I was lucky that the heat, you know, the way it went into the wall, uh, it did absorb quite a lot, so I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly fine. It's just the car that is still not uh, recovered yet. When you see the car that's first coming round, when it goes into the wall, the, the tyre is missing off the rims. All eyes were on the newly crowned fastest man in F1 during qualifying. The circuit requires drivers to be on full throttle for a third of a lap, so engine power is crucial. But a frustrating battle with setup and a twisty infield section more suited to the McLarens left him one thousandth of a second behind Coulthard. While Williams and McLaren contested the second row, Schumacher produced a lap over half a second quicker to take his third consecutive pole at the circuit. The Ferrari duo certainly were in a class of their own and scored the fifth all-red front row of the year. On race day, Michael Schumacher seems to have other things on his mind as he takes up pole position. His parking is more supermarket than motor speedway, but that's a minor distraction for Jean Todt as we are seconds from the lights going out. Barrichello makes a move towards his team leader, but switches his attentions to Coulthard as Schumi leads the charge into Turn 1. The McLaren slots into third, ahead of Ralph and Montoya. The end of lap one, and the Williams drivers are too close for comfort. One of them will have to yield, or there will be carnage. Sure enough, Ralph's belated braking sets up his team's nightmare scenario. His drivers have committed Formula One's ultimate sin. Ralph isn't a statistic just yet, but that's of little comfort to Patrick Head. Yeah, they're, they're allowed to race, but it's a fundamental requirement that they don't drive into their teammate. Ralph's breach of that rule puts him a lap down while a new rear wing is attached. Toyota show that inter-team battles don't have to end in tears as McNish and Sarlo fight over 13th place. Eddie Jordan's young charger makes a move on Frentzen for 10th. 
There's just enough room for the Jordan to go by, but both go offline, giving the position to Button. With more than enough aggression to spare, Sato makes amends two corners later. Ross Braun and Jean Todt are unlikely to see such action from their drivers as Schumacher and Barrichello leave Coulthard and Trulli behind. The Italian is desperate to get onto the podium for the first time since 1999. McLaren have a more immediate problem with Jacques Villeneuve. The former Indy 500 winner uses the banked curves better than Raikkonen and powers up to fifth. Honda achieves a rare victory over Mercedes. Williams is the next team looking to profit from Raikkonen's loss of speed as Montoya closes in on a world championship point. Jaguar's engine problems are far more pressing. De La Rosa's Cosworth incinerates itself while an over-eager Marshall puts the Spaniard in harm's way. The marshals got, got me over excited. They told me just to jump out of the out of the circuit. I jumped and there was a river, so I just <laughs> went into the river. I mean, <laughs> they should have told me, you know. <laughs> the Williams management also receive an unpleasant surprise, but in the form of a premature pit stop. Montoya mistook a pit wall signal and came in far too early. That's probably wrecked his race and will add even more fuel to a potentially fiery post-race debrief. Forty laps to go. Forty laps remaining in the race. This season's largest crowd turns its attention to Ralph Schumacher's battle to get back on the same lap as the leaders. He's got a mountain to climb as Button is outside the top ten. His older brother's only problem is maintaining his concentration as he comes in for his second stop. Under little pressure, the pit crew work to their usual high standard and quickly send the world champion on his way. There's not much time for the team to catch up with the rest of the race as Barrichello arrives for his final stop. Will the Brazilian hold station behind his teammate? Or will he be allowed to clinch second place in the Drivers' Championship with 10 points? Michael retakes the lead and it looks like the Ferraris can cruise to their eighth 1-2 finish of the season. Raikkonen doesn't have that luxury as for the 11th time this season his race is cut short. His teammate zeroes in on a podium position, but he's being caught by Montoya, who's overtaken Trulli and is anxious to make amends for angering his superiors. However, traffic and a shortage of laps are conspiring against the Colombian. As Montoya tries to end an undignified race on a high note, Ferrari look to complete their domination in front of the huge American crowd. Everybody is anxious to see if Barrichello will get the all-clear to claim his reward in style. Confusion reigns at Indy. Who won the United States Grand Prix? 
The timing system gives it to Barrichello by 0.011 of a second. One of the closest finishes in Formula One history. Barrichello's fourth win of the season earns him second place in the championship, while Villeneuve's sixth place puts BAR equal on points with Jordan. But that's not the headline story. Do you think Michael actually intended to let Rubens win that race? You need to talk to him. <laughs> what did he say on the radio then? Um, I, <clears throat> no, we'll, we'll come back to you on that. <laughs> Today, uh, I, I thought it was a good opportunity to, to go equal over the line. Uh, we tried, uh, and we failed by a little bit. Michael's attempt at choreography will be resented by some, but the team and many thousands of fans will be happy that Barrichello is the centre of attention again. Jean Todd's plan of action has been successfully completed, with one race to go. Japanese culture has nature and tranquility at its heart. The emphasis is on simplicity and inner peace, using meditation to find spiritual enlightenment. By way of contrast, Suzuka offers the thrills and spills of modern civilization. High flying rides and fast moving cars are the order of the day. But for the teams, there's an end of term party atmosphere throughout the paddock, especially at Minardi. Top 10 qualifying would be music to Toyota's ears at their home Grand Prix and the last for Mika Salo and Alan McNish. Since uh, uh, Spa, we uh, have been back to qualify in the top 10 regularly, not in Indianapolis, but uh, regularly uh, since Spa, and we hope we're going to be able to do the same here. <laughs> Everybody is so excited, and for sure we'll try our best to don't disappoint all the fans here in Japan. With his F1 future uncertain, Alan was desperate to impress. But it all went horribly wrong at 1.30R. The Toyota flew into the guardrails, but everyone breathed a sigh of relief when the Scot got out relatively unscathed. His car was totally destroyed and the session was stopped while repairs were carried out to the safety barriers. McNish had a lucky escape. Clearly shocked by such a violent smash, he was taken away for medical tests in the hope he would be fit to race tomorrow. Eddie Jordan's faith in Takuma Sato looked to have finally paid off once the session resumed. The overwhelming support for the Japanese driver helped him produce a stunning performance to take seventh on the grid, his best yet. Michael Schumacher may have taken pole, but he seemed content to let Sato handle the photographers. Japan's new star shared the spotlight with Toyota on race day. Mika Salo prepared for his last Grand Prix, but would his teammate be fit enough to race after his colossal accident during qualifying? After the accident from yesterday, uh, I rested for the rest of the day and I, I took part in the warm-up this morning, but after a medical examination afterwards, they felt that it was best that I didn't compete. The Jordan mechanics worked hard to ensure Giancarlo Fisichella avoided that fate after his V10 blew on the installation lap. The spare car was ready on time, but the Italian made the grid minus Honda's latest specification engine. 
His teammate had a much calmer pre-race period, while former Formula Nippon champion De La Rosa languishes in 17th. Even at the last event of the season, the pre-race tension is all too evident. Michael Schumacher makes full use of pole as Coulthard harries Barrichello. The Scot almost loses out to Ralph, who demotes Raikkonen to fifth. Anxious moments for the Renault mechanics as Trulli and Button both pressurise seventh-placed Sato. Inter-team rivalry is never a worry for Jean Todd, especially with the world champion in this sort of form. Barrichello struggles to keep Schumacher in sight, ahead of Coulthard, Ralph Schumacher and Raikkonen. Sauber's Brazilian charger is working hard to impress potential employers, but ends his tenure with the Swiss team on a flat note. It's a disappointing end to a generally impressive rookie season. Coulthard is secure in the knowledge that he will be driving for McLaren next year. This fact may help him deal with the frustration of the throttle problem. Lack of pace compared to Ferrari and Williams has also been hard to swallow for the Scot, who was billed as a pre-season title favourite. At the head of the field, Michael Schumacher is destroying the competition, despite having nothing left to prove. While the Ferraris continue to control the race from the front, Olivier Panis experiences his typical 2002 misfortunes. An electrical problem makes it 10 retirements out of 17 races for the desperately unlucky Frenchman. The Ferraris have been rock solid since Michael claimed the driver's title. Barrichello can concentrate fully on the race, knowing his equipment and his support are unlikely to let him down. The Brazilian led after Schumacher's initial stop, but rejoins in fourth behind Ralph and Raikkonen, who have both yet to stop. Sato comes in from sixth. The Renaults are dangerously close, having gained track position from earlier stops. The French team's strategy is a good one, and they look on target to cool the patriotic fever. Jordan's attention switches to Fisichella, whose 11th position is under threat from Villeneuve. The Canadian looks to make a move on the start-finish straight, but all thoughts of slipstreaming melt away like his Honda engine. Well done, boys. You've all worked super hard this season. Next year we'll get them. David Richards ponders the hard work ahead, while Truly is the latest mechanical victim. Renault's 14th retirement of the season is a statistic that Flavio Briatore and Jano Trulli won't want to be reminded of. Meanwhile, Sato is on the verge of rescuing his season. That's good, Zach. We're P6. You're going to push hard to catch Button, OK? He might just pass us on the exit of the pit lane, so watch out for him. The rookie has done his bit. Now the mechanics play their part in trying to keep the Jordan in the points. Sato's thousands of new fans voice their approval, but there's still 17 laps to go. McLaren also endure a nail-biting finish to the season as Raikkonen pursues a podium position. That goal slips away as the Finn overdoes it at the Degna curves. Ralf Schumacher still holds third, but will have to be on his guard as another Honda goes up in smoke. Fissi Keller experiences a touch of deja vu, but at least the fire isn't as out of control as his Belgian blow-up. While the Italian can finally relax, his Japanese teammate must be worried about the condition of his engine. The home crowd and his team will be hoping for some unsato-like caution. Hey, okay, Taku, you're in a safe position. You're safe. So nice and steady. With any luck, that small mistake will hammer the message home. Suzuka's engine braking spree continues at the expense of a probable podium finish for Ralf Schumacher.
This promotes Raikkonen to third, Montoya to fourth, and Takuma Sato to fifth place. Meanwhile, the sports benchmark is about to take his 11th victory of the season. Michael Schumacher wins the Japanese Grand Prix at a canter to take a formation finish with Barrichello without the controversy of Indianapolis. Even Schumacher's devastating victory doesn't overshadow the performance of Takuma Sato. Given the reaction, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this was the new world champion. The team's faith in Sato has been repaid in the form of his first two championship points, elevating Jordan above BAR and Jaguar. Overflowing with emotion, Sato makes a beeline for his boss. Yeah, we done it, boss. Brilliant. Just, just unbelievable. I mean, fans are exciting so much, and they are waving, you know, all 50 laps. So it's everything was perfect today. Kimi Raikkonen rounded off his season on a high, finishing best of the rest ahead of Montoya, with Button taking the last point. The Japanese Grand Prix shares a common feature with every other race this season. Michael Schumacher is on the podium. The five-time world champion scores almost double the points of his teammate, while Montoya clinches third place. Jensen Button wins the Battle of the Renaults, while Jacques Villeneuve ends up in 12th. Felipe Massa's first season nets four points, while Weber and Sato score two points apiece. Four drivers fail to score. Ferrari have the same number of constructors' points as the rest of the field put together. Every team scored at least two points this season. F1 2002 was owned by Ferrari. Many teams made gigantic steps forward, but still weren't in the same league as the world champions. Before the monumental game of catch-up begins, there's just time to reminisce. David Ryan of McLaren, which drivers have done a particularly good job in 2002 from your point of view? Difficult question. In general, I don't like to comment too much about uh, other drivers. Uh, tough question so early in the morning into Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I've been uh, impressed, really impressed by the five pole in a row by Montoya. What a idiot! The other one who impressed me uh, is Raikkonen. The way he adapted himself to a top team like McLaren so easily in his only second year of Formula One. They've all had their highlights. Some, some drivers have had poor races from time to time, but I would say pretty much all of them have had some very good races at times as well. Ask about drivers. He's done a fantastic job. Well, I think there is basically only one name you, you, that comes to mind. Like everybody, I would be tempted to say Michael Schumacher. It's Michael Schumacher. Look like Michael Schumacher. Well, obviously it's Michael Schumacher, isn't it? He is in a class of his own. I think you overestimate my power. <laughs> <laughs>